Good evening. I'd like to call to order this regular town council meeting for Tuesday, April 11th, 2023. Please rise for a moment of silence. I have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Councilor Allenson? Here. Councilor Carmody? Here. Councillor Fishbein. Here. Councillor Laffin. Councillor Marone. Here. Councillor Tata. Here. Councillor Testa. Councillor Zandri. Here. Chairman Cervoni. Here. Noting the removal of 3H from consent, can I get a motion on the rest of the consent agenda, please? Motion by Councillor Fishbein. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councillor Carmody. All those in, uh, noting Councillor Tata's recusal. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be recusing myself from the voting on the consent agenda. Thank you. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Hearing none. The consent agenda passes on to item four, which is 3H. Uh, can I get a motion to uh, Consider and approve appropriation of funds, ARPA funds, in the amount of $67,490 to surveillance security cameras at Doolittle Park. So moved. Moved by Councillor Allenson, seconded by Councillor Marone. Well, good evening. Um, this was actually Councillor Testa's item uh, removed from the consent agenda. He is en route. Um, but why don't you give us the helicopter view of what is going on here? Sure. So, and if uh, you could please identify yep. yourselves for the record. John Ventura, police chief. Kenny Michaels, director of parks and recreation. Thank you. So if you remember, um, Doolittle Park had, we had issues at Doolittle Park, right? So we had the playscape that was set on fire. We had some uh, assaults, issues with juveniles, and we came in kind of to the agreement and speaking with Mr. Michaels, is that, you know, we really need something full time. You know, the, the officers that are able to come and go through the park on, you know, selective enforcement details is great, but we needed something to protect that park 24 hours a day. So we began the journey of coming up with a plan, a camera plan for coverage of the park. We consulted with multiple companies and were able to put the bid out. And as you see, um, Security 101 won the bid, and we are currently in the process of establishing a fiber run the park so that when the camera system is ready to go, um, we have the uh, proper um, technology and infrastructure to be able to transport that image to the Wallingford Police Department. Thank you. Councillor Testa, welcome. Um, Hello. This is your item. Yes, it is. Thank you so much for timing it perfectly for me. Well, I dragged it a little bit for you, actually. Well, I, I assumed. I, I apologize for my tardiness. <clears throat> uh, my, my main, uh, the reason I, I pulled it from the consent agenda is, is my objection to how we're planning to pay for it. So that was my discussion I wanted to have, is why we were, the mayor was proposing using ARPA funds for it. Um, I have no objection to the, to the, the equipment. I'm in favor of it. I've been supportive of it all along. I, I'm happy to be able to hear about some of the more the details about how it's going to be utilized. I know there's been a lot of questions about uh, whether it be constantly monitored. My, my impression or my support of this all along has been that there would be a video record available similar to what we have at the schools. And in case there was an incident, the police would have something to look back to. Um, so if there's discussion of this being monitored on a regular basis. So the camera system is designed, the camera system is designed to transmit via fiber to the police department, which we would be able to live stream images from the park. Is, and are you, do you have a plan on having somebody 
watching it, or is it just going to sort of be there? So there's going to be a standalone system within the dispatch room that'll be on, and then a dispatcher would monitor it like they would uh, if we had a prisoner that needed to be okay. observed. So if a call comes in, then obviously you'd be able to see what's going on Correct. right away. Yes, and the cameras are designed uh, regardless of the time of day. Um, it has infrared capability, so we could see at night. Well, I mean, that, that capability is, in fact, more than I anticipated you having, so I'm pleased with that. Um, but again, for my fellow counselors, my, um, my concern is um, the use of ARPA funds to pay for this. So when it's appropriate to discuss that, let me know. Now? Okay, I'm against using ARPA funds for paying for this. So if the mayor would like to explain why he chose to do that, because we've been talking about this system for quite a while, and it was my understanding we had the money for it set aside, and it was just a matter of getting the bids out. So I'd just be curious what the administration's point was, uh, position was in choosing to use ARPA funds. Well, I think it's a significant amount of money. I think it's an appropriate use. It's for the park, making sure that everyone can enjoy the park and safety. Um, anything else would be a, a guess as far as uh, tapping other money in the budget. This is from outside the budget. Again, it's appropriate for ARPA, and we wanted to move very quickly, and uh, this would allow us to do this. Uh, initially, the estimates on the cost of this were, well, in excess of $100,000. So uh, that was a concern. The, the, fortunately, the amount of money has come down significantly, but um, uh, in the formative stages, it was expected to be a far larger sum of money, but I still feel that it's very appropriate for us to move forward with it, and uh, the ARPA funds are, are available for appropriation. Uh, you mentioned the enjoyment of the parks. I mean, again, I my understanding of the ARPA funds for municipal projects is that it would you know it's pretty wide ranging pretty wide open, but there has to be some type of tie-in with um, providing opportunity, improving opportunity, improving, improving services, overcoming, uh, you know, uh, a lack of uh, recreation that might have been, you know, due to the pandemic. So is it the position of the administration that the installation of surveillance of a surveillance system, which I'm in favor of, um, improves the um, um, opportunity to enjoy the park, and that's why we're justifying it for, as ARPA money. Well, I think uh, the town, for the amount of money, uh, the 13 plus million, is, is able to use those funds in almost an unfettered way. The initial rules of of uh, ARPA, those were not the initial rules. Uh, but subsequently, they amended it to say that the percentage, a percentage, and I forget what the percentage was, 10%? 10? So the 10, we can use 10 million, however you want. Uh, however you want. Correct. Well, that's not necessarily true. You can't use it to lower the tax rate. Well, so I'm saying, you're, are you saying as capital expenditures? Correct. However you want. Correct. So we could we could take this money and, and, and pave roads. I'm not sure about that. I would have to look. Okay. Well, okay. Well, I'm just I mean, maybe we disagree over the word unfettered. Um, so and I'm and believe me, I'm going to propose all sorts of uses for this money, um, but my objective is to improve, enhance, so on and so forth, or address issues that. Um, exhibited uh, shortfalls or whatever due to the pandemic, um, and, I, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm again. I think it's pretty wide open. I just, as this is the first thing we're really seeing, um, but it, other than what's in the budget, I, I'm just looking for an explanation or some kind of guideline that's being applied, because we're going to be getting into this in a pretty deep way very soon. And if this is the first thing we're using the money for, I want to make sure that, you know, what the justification yeah. is. Well, there's an immediacy, obviously, and even the original rules uh, were 
supportive of using the money for purposes of allowing people of all, all uh, economic capabilities to use areas of parks and recreation, given that those are the areas that people were encouraged to use because of the pandemic, and to the extent that they could be improved and made safer, obviously, in our case, have people feel comfortable to be there, um, those were recognized reasons to be spending the ARPA money. So I, I, I really think it fits within the original rules as well as the subsequent rules that came out. And there's an immediacy. So any other source of money would involve estimates of what else may be happening uh, toward the end of this budget year. Uh, and this would avoid those questions and allow us to move ahead with this immediately. I, I suppose if, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the um, Park and Rec Department was um, proposing that we, you know, make the parts safer structurally with equipment or, or padding under the swings, and I'm just throwing ideas out there, more better guardrails on a bridge, I'm, I'm making things up now, but things that would be, okay, this is going to make the park more accessible and safer uh, for more people to enjoy, then that would fit. And you know, I guess I'm in my mind, I'm just trying to um, justify that uh, adding security improvements, if you will, <clears throat> uh, would fall into that same category. Because we could, if we turned around and said, we're going to hire a full-time security guard to work at the park, that would be the same justification as using the money to pay for this camera equipment. So if everybody agrees that that would be a justifiable expense, according to ARPA, to hire an armed guard to sit at the park, I'm not being too far-fetched here, because that falls under the category of applying um, surveillance, security um, programs, if you will. I just I had a problem with using the ARPA money, but now that it's, I just look, was looking for an explanation from the uh, administration. I have to give it some thought, but I wanted my fellow counselors to ponder that aspect of this, not the actual program itself, not the equipment, uh, but the use of ARPA funds to pay for it. And if everybody's comfortable with that, um, this is one of those where, you know, I, I would be willing to go along with my colleagues if there's a majority I'm not looking to make a, make a stand here on anything, but I want you all looking at it the way I did. Thank you. Councillor Marone. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, Councillor Testa, to your point, I think that Wallingford has been the outlier sort of in our approach to, the, to how we handle the ARPA funds. There's been a few communities, Bristol and Meriden, that have sort of taken uh, public money and put it in private hands for a variety of reasons, but most communities haven't. So I think this is in line sort of with what you've seen in North Haven and Cheshire and some other places where they've spent, you know, most of the, most of the money on, on public projects that are not, you know, maintenance, but this is something that's a, uh, an addition to the park. I mean, I think if you're looking for, to connect it to, to ARPA, people have, um, uh, the pandemic has caused a lot of people to spend different amounts of time in town. You know, like my company got rid of our building and so now I work from home full time. I'm in town more than I ever was before. So, you know, I have, take more advantage of the parks now than I have in the past. So, and obviously, you know, my story's not particularly relevant, except that, you know, things change, and I think an enhancement to the park based on sort of the, the increasing crime that we're, that we're experiencing and some of the other things, to me, seem sort of like in line with what the ARP is designed to do. So the pandemic kind of left some, you know, some nasty uh, issues in our economy and, it, um, you know, in criminal justice and well, along with some other things. But that's why I see this as all sort of a, a straight line from the, you know, from ARPA to where we are now. But it's a, it's an, a good thing to, you know, to bring up. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Zandri. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I don't have a big issue with using these funds this way either based on, based on, on the, you know, the, the fact that the funds are eligible for this. But I do have a question. If we didn't have the ARPA funding available and we needed to do this pretty quickly, we would be looking around in the budget because we're basically dealing with two months left of the budget. Couldn't we utilize $67,000 out of contingency right now to do this? 
Oh, I, I'm hesitant to do that right now, given the amount of money and uh, what else may be lurking as far as needs. So um, after April 1st, we can go searching through other funds in the budget, but there's no need to do that with this, this money being available, and we want to move quickly. So how much do we have in contingency right now? I don't know the exact number. But you have a ballpark? It's probably around, it's above 200,000. 200,000. So I guess that's my only concern. Yes, we, we certainly could use this, the ARPA funds for this project. We could also use a piece of that. And, and, and again, to the mayor's point, after, May, after April 1st, with basically 60 days to go or so with the budget, there, there are other line items. We could go hunting and pecking all over the place and do this right now. We could, we could move money out of contingency right now instead of using ARPA and use, this, and use ARPA for something else. I just don't know why we laser focused ARPA on this when we've got other options. That was my judgment. That's, that's a fair assessment as well. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to vote no on this. I'm, I'm going to support this because it needs to get done. Um, I, just, I just can see that we, you know, I, we've got other situations. We've had it in the past. We've got funds that get left over, and they get rolled back into the, the general fund balance when it would be better to consume them. Um, that, that's my only hesitation. Otherwise, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote for this because I don't want this to not pass, and I don't want any more delay on this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. I just had some questions about the system itself. Um, a mention had been made about recording, and I, and I didn't hear that confirmed. Is, is there going to be recording? Yes, it will uh, record and also live stream. So there'll be a server at the police department that'll record the data that's transmitted and also give us the capability to watch it live. So if we needed to go back, say, five, ten days and try to find something, it has the capability to go back because of the storage that it's okay. designed for. That makes sense. I was just looking for the, the link up. And, uh, you know, I'm a little concerned because, you know, we have many parks in our town. And Doolittle isn't the only park with problems. So, you know, I foresee that sometime in the near future, we're going to be talking about cameras at many of our parks. That's, that's a very strong possibility. So, you know, we are setting a precedent tonight, perhaps, and saying that these expenditures should be made from, from ARPA. Um, but another two years from now, if it's delayed for that long, if we're crossing that bridge at that time, the ARPA money is not going to be there, more than likely. I think it has to be expended by them. You know, so that's, that's a concern. I, I was a little puzzled when, you know, I understand that Park and Rec is, you know, in charge of our parks. Um, but this is, a, this is really an assistance of the police department. Um, so I I'm fully wrap my arms around the collaboration, right? We all need to work together. Um, because I didn't notice anywhere that the Park and Rec Commission had met to talk about ARPA in conjunction with this. Is that, that's accurate, right? That's correct. Okay. So, isn't there money in your existing budgets that's left, left over? I mean, between the both of you. I'm looking at the budget book for, for next year and, and what is presented to us as far as what's been expended for during the current year. And isn't there 67.4 that can be transferred in the present year's budget to make this expenditure? In ours, uh, we're lean, so I, I don't, we couldn't fully fund it. I don't even know if we could. No, we couldn't fully no, fund but it. I don't even think we can partially fund it 50% of the way. Okay. And, Chief, what about? We would have to look. Um, 
We have a accreditation manager that's beginning a couple new positions that will kick in before the fiscal ends. Um, it is possible, but I just can't make that uh, decision right now. Um, but in May or whenever the uh, fiber install is completed, they will begin billing the police department. So we will incur that fee every month. Um, just putting it out there as far as the project goes for a timeline. So as far as your budget for the ongoing utilization of the infrastructure, it will be in your budget, not Park and Rec's budget. Correct. So for the next fiscal that we just prepared, that cost is associated with our budget for the fiber. Okay. And then I, I guess to Mr. Senna, who um, always gives very concise answers, and I really appreciate it. Um, I mean, can't we just amend what's before us to have it taken out of contingency? We do not do that at a meeting. It's too fraught with potential error. Uh, you have the documents before you. That's what has to be acted on today. We are not going to change them. Okay. Well, I understand that's the executive branch's representation, but um, I guess for Attorney Farrell, then, is there anything that precludes us from modifying to have the money come out of a different place than ARPA. What was the question again? Sure, the executive branch has come to us with a proposal to have this expenditure um, come out of the ARPA. Um, it's my understanding, and I'm just confirming with you, that we can amend where the money comes from, not the amount, but, um, and, and say like, that we make a motion to have the money come out of contingency as opposed to ARPA. I, I don't think you can do that without an appropriation from the administration. Okay, and what, where is that based upon? The, the place of the, where the money comes from is not detailed in the charter. The appropriation itself is approved by the administration. So is there a particular portion of the charter that you're relying upon? I'm actually relying upon the agenda that's before you. Okay. And if I can help, if it requires an appropriation, that would have to identify the source of the money and what it's to be used for. That's what the approval is for the appropriation. To change that, it would be done without, without approval, without an appropriation, which would make it ineffective. I understand that's the position of the executive, but Attorney Farrell, what portion of the chart are you relying upon? I, I don't see any portion of the chart that says that. This is not a new question. It's been dealt with before, and appropriations require an approval from the admi uh, administrative branch. We're not, I'm not proposing to deal with the, the amount of the appropriation, but it's an, it's an ARPA situation. And an appropriation is com coming from either outside the budget, uh, it, it would, otherwise it's a transfer within the budget, but appropriations require the approval of the administrative branch, which obviously would have to identify the source that you're appropriating from. Okay. Well, I, I understand it's the position of the executive, but the, the law department has been asked about the charter provision, and I'm trying to find that, but um, I, I guess in the absence of that, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to have the appropriation of $67,490 come from the contingency account as opposed to the ARPA. I don't hear a second, so the motion fails. Councilor Tato. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, Councilor Testa, if I understand you don't want to use ARPA, but then didn't second the motion, I'm not sure 
what your I'm not sure what your idea is at this point, I guess. Um, and then while I, while I have the floor, I just wanted to say um, I'm, I'm fine with using ARPA for this. I'm just I'm glad we're using ARPA for something, finally. Um, that has to do with a park, and I think it's definitely an allowable use um, under the federal government's final rules. So I'm good with that. Um, I, I'm most likely going to support this, um, but I hate that I hate that we have to do this, and I understand that this is where we are, and this park has been a problem. And I think for the safety of the neighbors, um, which are all very close to that park, that that we need to do this, but. Um, I hate the idea that we have to. I hate that we have to put cameras in our public parks. Um, I don't like the idea of it. I don't like the idea of, you know, Big Brother always watching, but I do understand um, where we are. So I just wanted to, to voice my concerns, or not my concerns, but just that I'm upset that it, it came to this. But uh, I do understand the, the necessity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Testa. I mentioned that um, my main, I wanted to hear the justification and if it appeared that, you know, the majority of the council was comfortable with it, I had no objection to going along with it. Um, I, more, I was more interested in bringing up the question, hearing the discussion in anticipation of all the lively discussions which will be coming soon for all of our in anticipated individual suggestions on how to utilize these funds. So, I'm okay. Questions or comments from the public? Bob Gross, Long Hill Road. To whose ever point it was, maybe Councilor Andrews. This is an ARPA use under, it counters increases in violence. Um, anything that increases violence are, um, is an allowable use, New Haven. Police bought new cameras, and stuff like that. Um, question, though, on the use of the money. The, the playground that burned, council received an additional $20,000 from Cho. 10000 supposedly was the deductible, but there's still 10000 remaining. Why wouldn't that 10000 go towards these cameras? It only makes sense instead of putting in the general fund. Mr. Mayor? The money from Choate will have to be used. I believe it already has been. There's a PO. It hasn't been spent yet. But okay. Th that so has to be used at the later. park. All right. Uh, so sec secondly, it is my judgment that this is an appropriate use for these funds. Uh, I'm not interested at this point in trying to dovetail and patchwork the amount of money necessary to have this completed. That is before the council, and I still would request their approval. Not, not question, but you had an extra 10,000 left over because the town had appropriated X number of dollars for the park. You got um, insurance money for it, minus your deductible, and 20,000 from CHO. So after your deductible, there was approximately 10,000 left over. So what happens to that money? It just goes back in the general fund. So you pocket 10,000 for the town instead of putting it for good use here with this additional 10,000 of ARPA could go for something else. Nobody's saying not to use money for ARPA, but why are you using, you should use ARPA. It always says in the ARPA use that you should use it for the highest and best use that you can use it for. Well, if you have $10,000 sitting that you recovered from the insurance claim and from CHO, that money should go for this, and then you'd have a better use of the ARPA money for something that you normally wouldn't purchase, but you could purchase with the ARPA dollars that you normally wouldn't purchase. And here's the counter. I would disagree with your characterization that it's recovering money. If we didn't spend deductible, then we didn't spend it. Um, that's, that's taxpayer money, too, and that's in the budget. But if we didn't spend the deductible, we're not recovering anything. We're just not spending that because we have source of other funds. And again, it is my judgment that this is an appropriate expenditure. It should come from the, the uh, ARPA funds. And we need the improvement in the park for a variety of reasons. Uh, it benefits everyone. It's time to move ahead. Nobody's, nobody's questioned that. But I don't understand what you're saying about recovering the deductible. You had a claim, say it was 
50,000, you have a 10,000 deductible, you received 40. But then you received a donation, brings you to 60. So the, the park cost you 50, there's 10,000 that's still excess that you recovered that was more than you have to outlay in total expenses. So that 10,000 could be used for this, and then ARPA, the 10,000 for ARPA could be used for best and highest use, and that's, again, how the government recommended to use this type of money. Um, and that, and otherwise, you're just gonna put that 10,000 back into the budget. For I believe that the purchase of the cameras and the heightened security and our care and concern for that park is the highest and best use. I don't think you're understanding or not wanting to understand what I said. Thank you. Uh, Mike Lydon, Pomeroy Avenue. Um, I can't stress enough, and I know I've been here before to talk about, as a neighbor to Doolittle, the ongoing issues out there. We've already had, now we're on the three wonders of the world of Wallingford. First, last spring, we had Fight Club out there where the track coach was attacked. Then we had the barbecue in November, or Halloween barbecue, let's call it, where my neighbors and I were leaving our house and we see the playscape on fire. Two, week, two Fridays ago, I'm leaving my house to go pick up pizzas for dinner, and I have two youths that are riding dirt bikes in the park, and they're going all over the place. They're starting at the bridge at Henry Street, and they're ripping up turf, and they're all over. They're also jumping out into the road, one of these youths jumped out in front of my car and then sped down Wall Street. So I pulled off to the side of the road and called dispatch on this. The, and I have to say, Chief, Chief, they were out within five minutes because I was back. I just went up the road to Half Moon, was back. By the time I was there, there's an SUV parked. The two youths are literally antagonizing this officer that's out there. They proceed to drive down Wall Street and go up and down the center of town. All you can hear is the revving of a dirt bike in the center of town, driving on the roads, unsafe. Motorists are going every which direction. This is like constant. Could we stop with the squabbling? It despises the fact that whenever ARPA comes up, it seems like we pause any reasoning. This needs to be done. Just fund it, get the cameras up, and then moving forward, you're right, Council Fishbein. This probably will have to occur in other parks. We're not the only neighborhood that's living with this. We're just the one that seems to be the, set, the epicenter of all these problems. Please, just vote on this, have it funded, let it proceed. Thank you. Evening, Jason Michael, Meadow Street. Uh, a couple of different topics around the same origin. Um, so I, I heard that there was a, going to be a live feed. So will the public have access to the live feed? No, it's going to be a secure line directly into the police department. Why? Because we're the ones that are monitoring it. There's nothing that would preclude you from filing a FOIA request for a, some footage that you would want, but... So the public can be observed, but can't do the observing. The purpose of the cameras are to allow the officers or the dispatchers to identify an issue before someone actually calls it in to give us uh, advanced time to get to the park and interrupt whatever is going on. Understood. Thank you. I just have a hard time understanding why it's fiber, it's fiber optic, I imagine, going to be on the web or however it gets to the police station. It's a, it's a fiber run, yes, correct. What would, be the, what would be the reason that the public couldn't watch the live feed of the park that they are in? The system that it's designed for is it's designed to feed into the police department and also to store on our servers, which is a secured server. If we were to open it up to the public, it would compromise our system. Um, just in order to get this footage into our building with all the uh, firewalls that we have is a task. So I would not even know or begin to know how we would allow that to stream live to the public when we have so many security features just to allow us to watch it. Right. So, so if, that, if that procedure were found to be easy, would there be an objection to the public 
having access to the feed of a public park. I don't have an issue with that. Well, I would have an issue what with it the because be? at that point it's vulnerable to being hacked into, which is what we cannot tolerate. But there's a live feed on probably half the town's front doors that aren't being hacked into. What would be the advantage of hacking into a public park's camera feed? Well, one advantage would be to eliminate what was on there as evidence so that uh, there, there, it's not a useful surveillance. I wasn't you know, aware of that. There's no, there's no, we, this is a, a limited purpose for police purposes, period. Right, but it's the public being filmed. And the public will know that. Well, yeah. <laughs> right. And you're being filmed a lot everywhere. But that is not for public purposes. That is for law enforcement purposes, and the two cannot be blended together. Why, why not? Because there's no reason for us to maintain a site that then can be used for personal purposes. This is for law enforcement. It may also encourage people to go there and be acting out because they know they're going to be on a feed somewhere, and uh, it's not for the purpose of encouraging behavior that we would want to discourage. So it would be much like the feed that WPAA ran for years and years and years downtown. WPAA. Where anyone could walk in front of it and wave to the people in their living room. And WPAA or any private individual can do as they please. So can the town. Not, no, the town cannot do just as it pleases. And okay. where, it's, I, I won't go where it is police purposes, it must be limited to law enforcement purposes. Who's, who makes that rule? You're talking to him. Oh. Gotcha. I acquiesce. Secondly, I was hoping that the ARPA funds, were, and, and I'm getting on the carousel and picked my horse here, but the remaining money for town projects or capital projects or whatever we're calling them is a certain amount, right? Are we going to keep peeling off pieces of it as things pop up when there's money obviously out there to help secure that for a, a what we've, we've dissected the public portion of this to death, but we're just going to start flipping off money from ARPA without seeing what's needed, what the priorities are in town, where they lie, not saying that this isn't a priority or a high one for that matter, but I would hope that we would look at the money as a, as a bulk piece and look at the projects that would be up for that money before we start slicing pieces of it off until maybe there's concerns that something may pop up between now and, and, the, and the budget year, whatever money's left, and we should use this ARPA money. So who's to say that something will be needed and we're already peeling this stuff off little by little. I just would hope for caution going forward. I'm not saying not to spend this money, but to start picking away at this amount without getting the total need in front of us, uh, I think would be a, a, a mistake. Thank you. All right. Uh, there being no other hands, I bring it back to the council. Um, Councillor Allenson. Um, I just wanted to comment on Mr. Michael's, um, two of his points. So, <clears throat> sorry. Um, the, first of all, I don't agree with making it public only because um, I think that, you know, there are certain people who need to stay away from parks and places where children are. I don't think public access is appropriate necessarily. Um, and I do think a reasonable request for FOI does, is, is a very, um, is a good solution. Um, you know, I, I hate to go there because I know that co people don't commonly think of those things because we don't do them in, um, society it's very taboo but um, I just for this for security purposes of 
you know, kids and families. I just think that's a sticky area. Um, I do also agree um, with Mr. Michael's point of we don't want to just start picking off ARPA money to fulfill projects. We want to see the town have meaningful projects completed with the ARPA money. So it is something that I know that we're all considering. Um, I have my issues with using this money for this, but given the but given the kind of necessity around it and the security issues that we're having, I do think that it's, you know, I do think that there is an urgency and a just cause for it. So I'm in support of it. Um, but with the hesitation that future funding, I would like to see some proposals for meaningful full projects um, for the town um, and hopefully many of them from uh, Mr. Michaels. So um, thank you for letting me speak. Um, thanks. All right. Uh, if there's nothing else, Madam Clerk, please. Councillor Fishbein. Uh, Chief, um, well, a side question. Are you going to be here for later when the Houston Social Services is here? I wasn't planning on it, okay. but. Because <laughs> like, I'm going to bring up the JRB, and I didn't know if you, you were going to want to, but we could do that another day. Um, I would expect that the camera, there was talk about manipulation, all that stuff. I would expect, and I'd certainly leave it up to you, the cameras are going to be high enough that one can't, you know, put tape over the lenses and that kind of stuff. That um, and you're going to post signs that indicate that recording is going on. So Correct. That those, and it only records uh, video, no sound. So it's yeah, not, but, yeah. you know, certainly I would think it would be appropriate that if somebody didn't want to be part of the video for whatever reason, you know, we have people that uh, have, you know, we go to our schools, we can't take pictures of all the kids, right? Correct. Some kids for other, you know, for various reasons. So I would expect that there'd be some sort of notice when you enter the park that, you know, you use this park, you're going to be videoed to give the opportunity for someone to go elsewhere if they choose. Absolutely. Okay. I just wanted to make clear. Okay. So thank you. Seeing no other hands, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Councillor Allenson? Yes. Councillor Carmody? Yes. Councillor Fishbein? No. Councillor Marone? Yes. Councillor Tata? Yes. Councillor Testa? Yes. Councillor Zandri? Yes. Councillor Cervoni? Uh, yes. The motion passes. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right, on to the public question and answer period. Good evening again. Mike Lydon, Pomeroy Avenue. Um, so it's kind of timely, uh, the previous subject we were discussing. I emailed a few counselors a draft of a juvenile review board ordinance. I actually have copies here with me tonight. I would asked that the council entertain establishing a juvenile review board. Um, based on some of the experiences we're having and just hearing the stories from some of the police in town, it's an alternative to the criminal justice system. And I just wanted to read right from, and I use the several communities as an example that have JRV boards that are successful. Um, the purpose of the statement of purpose, the juvenile review board, is an authorized program within the Youth and Social Services Department in collaboration with the Wallingford Police Department. The board is designed to review situations of juvenile contact slash arrest to provide an alternative and early means of assisting youths and their families who are troubled or in trouble. The board only reviews cases where juveniles have admitted guilt to charges filed by the police department. Um, I think it's time that we, we look at something like this and I really appreciate that the, the council, maybe through the ordinance committee, look at this Go ahead. the ordinance committee already agrees okay I, I have a draft if you would like to save save some time um, if it's okay I'll approach give you a copy of it and I can you, you can leave it with the clerk with but the clerk. I, I, do you want me to email then also please. the clerk that would that would be easiest perfect um, and <laughs> apparently we have professionals here to assist so mr. Glidden uh, and director Miranda will tell you we've been working 
um, tirelessly over the past couple months to establish one, and we are about to roll one out probably within the next couple weeks. Um, We've been in contact with the New Haven Probation Office along with the Meriden um, JRB and we've established a contact for the town of Wallingford and we have already um, taken the steps to train the officers uh, at the Wallingford Police Department and as soon as the actual hearing books are um, collected from the, the company that we had contracted to print them, um, the program would be put in place. Excellent. No, I mean, just I'm just thinking of other ways. Like I like I said, I mean, you know how many stories we've we've been telling you about what's going on either in the center of town, et cetera. So I really appreciate it. But like I said, I try to put some effort into this and try to ask the council to look into this. So I appreciate everyone. Apparently, in this. you were right on I'm, it at the same time as we were. <laughs> and as a context for the dirt bikes, we've been chasing them around for the past three weeks ourselves. And before we came to this meeting, we were actually chasing them. Um, we arrested three of the dirt bike riders already, and we have one more that we would need to get. Yeah, I was on, on my way home from work. I got to, uh, I was at the intersection of the post office, and I had one come up right by me, take a right, and actually go right, right in front of town hall. And I was like, oh, this is kind of becoming the new norm. It's, and it, was a, it wasn't a familiar face like the other two that are familiar faces which we all have seen in the neighborhoods in the center i mean they're just constant those individuals so i really pr thank you for your help on this thank you <laughs> <laughs> sit back down yeah, let's go, we'll go sit. anyone else seeing no other hands i close the public question and answer period and move on to item six uh, which is a discussion regarding the pension valuation report from July 1, 2022. We have uh, a member of our pension commission, and I think we have professional staff here. If you can identify yourself for the record, please. You can make yourself comfortable first. Good evening. Uh, my name is Gary Draghi. I'm the uh, chairman of the town's pension commission. Um, uh, my day job is the CIO or the chief investment officer for the city of Hartford uh, in its pension funds. Uh, prior to that, I worked uh, over 15 years in the state treasurer's office in the investment unit there. And uh, these days, I combine, I guess, looking back, I've spent over 30 years dealing with the management of public pension funds. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tony Trangizi. I'm a partner at Fiducian Advisors, which is the investment consulting firm that the Pension Commission has, has engaged to assist in the oversight of the plan from an investment perspective. Uh, Fiducian Advisors is an institutional consulting firm. We advise to over $225 billion in fiduciary assets, uh, including more than uh, 40 municipal plans in New England. Thank you. Councilor Tata, your item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you for being here. When we uh, received the pension valuation report um, dated Jan July 1st, um, I went through it. Um, admittedly, this is a little out of my wheelhouse, so uh, <laughs> I just had a couple of questions. Um, and just as, as an overall, and I believe you probably received these questions ahead of time, um, but I was hoping you could just maybe give us some highlights um, you know, of our pension program where we stand you know is it strong is it um, you know we hear a lot in the news about pension programs municipal or state you know pension programs that are you know failing or they're underfunded um, and so I just kind of wanted to get an overview of how we're doing um, especially going into budget season um, but specifically my two questions were um, well I'll ask them one at a time so I don't overwhelm them <laughs> but uh, the first question is, it looks like there was a 14.9% loss um, in market share. Um, and I just want to know from, in your professional opinion, is that, is that alarming or is that typical in this market? Uh, yeah, this is, <coughs> excuse me, so that was for the last fiscal year return. And that was uh, roughly in line with what broad markets offered. It was a very difficult environment where we saw interest rates go up and so bond prices came down. Equities also sold off during that time frame. The pension plan's portfolio and asset allocation is constructed uh, 
with it very well diversified and constructed in a manner that uh, is designed to absorb years like that, but also have offsetting years and over time achieve the objective, which uh, over the long run it has done that. Okay, great. So those those years when the market was doing really well, we obviously you do better than some years you're not going to do well. Is that where the um, uh, where is it? So the actuar actuarial value basis looks like is that that's where it shows basically the spread over time, correct? Right. So so the actuar I'm not we're not the actuarial firm for the for the um, pension, but what they do is they smooth. Um, they, do, they use smoothing to offset years like last year or years like the previous year, which was a very good one. So you don't, um, so you continue contributions at an appropriate level and you don't have dramatic amount of increase in contributions off of a bad year like the previous one. Okay, understood, thank you. Um, and then my second question was, um, so it looks like the recommendation was to fund at 24.8% um, this year and I'm wondering Actually, I believe that's our current year budget we're in. How does that compare to other municipalities? I know I, I don't know. I can only say from you know my past experiences. I don't believe that is a you know a, a uncommon amount. I, you know, and I, I have a feeling it may be a little. I, I don't want to reach out because again, we're not the actuaries, but. And they would see each, uh, you know, each plan, you know, in different towns and, and even at state levels, whatever. But I want to say that that's probably, you know, in line or a little lower than some. Okay. Uh, excuse me, Council Tata. Sure. I just want to be clear that that 24.8 is the percentage of payroll that we use to fund the pension. So we're we're funding the actuaries' recommended contribution 100%. But how we get there is by 24.8% of the payroll. Okay, understood. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and I just want to look through um, a couple other things, I think. So it looks like on uh, page five of the report, um, it says, I've assessed whether the funding policy will be sufficient to cover future benefit payments and administrative expenses. The current funding policy is anticipated to cover these costs indefinitely. So I'm assuming that means that at the rate we're going now, they're not seeing that we're going to be in trouble five years down the road or 10 years down the road. Is that correct? I, well, I, I guess I would explain that. And again, I'm not trying to take ownership of this or, or pretend that I am an actuary. I have enough problems. You might want to get on the mic a little oh, more, please. Thank I'm you. Not trying to be an actuary, but I have, have enough trouble having being a recovering accountant. Um, but I think the analogy I would use is a mortgage. You know, you, as long as you make your mortgage payments, you will, you know, at the end have paid off the house. I think the idea with a pension fund is that it, as long and one of the strengths I would say of the town and, and certain towns that have avoided trouble is that they make the pension contributions every year. So even when times are tough, you make the pension contribution over time, you will you know, pay all your retirees their benefits when due. And that's what we're currently doing, correct? Yes. Perfect, okay. Yes. Okay, that's, that's all I have for now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Robert. Councilor Zandri. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. So, M Mr. Senate, you said, you said we're doing a hundred percent of the funding is that what we're being recommended to fund or we're doing a hundred percent we're we're funding what the actuaries are recommending to be funded all right so if they say we should be doing 74 percent we're doing 74 percent like they they indicate so basically what they do is they say you should put nine I would have to look in here, but let's just for easy numbers. They would say you need to put in $11 million for the year. And then what they'd calculate for us is, here's what our payroll is expected to be. What percent do we need to get to that $11 million? So that's where that 24.8 comes. So it's, it's a set number that they calculate back to get a percentage of payroll. Okay. So when I look at these numbers, and, and so help me in case I'm incorrect here. 
it says we had a funded ratio of 76% last year when we had that, that big bump and then it, with, with investments. Then we had a slip in the investments and we're now funded at 73.3%. In both years, we, we got a number, we put those numbers in, but that was based on a good year of return and some bad returns and it changed the percentage. So we're not funded at 100% right now. We're funded at 733 Correct. So we're, you are correct. We're, okay. The fund is not funded at 100%, but we fund what the actuaries tell us to fund each year. So, you know, so if they told us to do $9 million and we only put $4 million, then we wouldn't be doing what we're supposed to do. But we do put in what they tell us. So every year we're trying to get, you know, we're trying to get above 75%, but things change. People retire, you know, markets. You know, there's so many factors that go into it that that number is tough to, to get. You know, built into that number is trying to get to 100%, but you can't do it all at once. So in simple terms, we have an unfunded liability. At one time, I think it, it was before my time, but I think it was probably 2007, maybe, we were... 2007, 2008, we were 100% we were funded, and then the, the uh, stock markets and the investments uh, didn't, didn't return what we expected. There were losses, and uh, in 2008, certainly, was part of that whole decline, and so that... that took the town off of the 100% funding. But we have an unfunded liability, which I think is what uh, then the actuaries look at, and then how do we begin to recover that? And that's ultimately what comes out is the amount the town should put into the plan through the budgetary uh, infusion of money every year. And for this year, it's 24.8% of salary. So. What would, what would happen, so, so I, I think I understand this in my head. So with the unfunded accrued liability, what that basically means is if everybody retired tomorrow and wanted to be paid out, we'd be short that amount. We'd have to come up with that amount all at once. Yes. Okay. And, and it, that's not realistic either. I just want to make sure I understand those, this line that I'm looking at because Based on what I'm hearing, we are, we are keeping, I don't want to say keeping speed, but to use Mr. Draghi's point, like paying the mortgage. We know the mortgage is a debt that you're paying down. This is, this is like funding your retirement. I know that if I want to reach X when I'm 65 years old, based on my historical returns, I should put in this amount this year. And if the market swings up, fantastic. I should still put in that amount the following year. Now, how, how much variance do we have on maybe better than average years? The mayor mentioned, you know, way back in 2007, we were at 100%. Did the actuaries back then tell us to, you know, still put a certain amount of funding in or back off or? So again, this was before my time, but I've seen those reports, but when you were at 100%, the contribution, I believe, for at least one or two years was zero. Zero. So we didn't, we didn't add. So it would almost be, as, again, I'll use the retirement example. If, if I felt that I needed to put in $10,000 this year to get to my, the level that I'm supposed to be at for 54 years old, and I was somehow above that because I got better than average returns, I didn't put my 10 grand in. That was the, but that was based on advice we received, right? Correct. So we... The policy since the mayor has been in office is what the actuaries tell us to do is what we do. Okay, and so I mean it looks like from, from the way this report reads and the way that I read and thank you for, for letting me know that I was reading it the way I, I thought I should be. We, we look like we can support this. This doesn't look like it's an, it's not like one year or the other has been a straight, this has been pretty steady right about this level. It's been 
up or down small amounts, but the percentage versus payroll has been pretty static based on these returns. Correct, and then, you know, one of the things at 10 years ago, our expected rate of return was 8%. So we weren't getting that. So the actuaries, to get in line with other towns, wanted us around 7%. So for the last 10 years, we've been changing that by 0.1 every year. We are now at 7% expected rate, but that fills into that number as well. And then there, there's always something that comes up. So, you know, now they're going to want to change mortality tables and, and, you know, there's all things that come into play. And they do this on, they don't, they don't follow one year spikes. Like, well, you got that rounding thing, that curve, so, they, they smooth it out. So right? there's five years smoothing. So two years ago, we were at a record high. So it's a five year average. So we still even though we, we had a very good year, very bad year, we still haven't seen the full effect of that because they don't want us, they don't want it to say, all right, fund five million one year, and then now we, now we have to fund 14 million because we just had a bad year. Because you had a short year. All right, that makes sense too. All right, um, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Certainly. Um, so the, the requirement that the town gets an actuarial recommendation and follows it I mean, aside from the fact that it's a sound policy, isn't there a statutory basis for that in Connecticut? We do have to have the actuary report. Okay. But whether you choose to do what they say is, is you know, that's how the state of Connecticut got into their, their trouble. Is they were told to contribute, but they didn't contribute for 20 years. Okay. But you are required to have it done. I mean, clearly, this is something that credit rating agencies look at to determine whether or not you are following uh, the, the liabilities, the, the personnel costs, pension, um, and uh, that's, that's an area of important concern to the credit rating agencies. If you can show that you are doing what the actuaries tell you, then, then obviously that's pleasing to them. If you are not, that, that clearly, I think, and evidence of what happens with credit ratings, you are, are punished for it. Thank you, Councillor Testa. Thank you, thank you, gentlemen. <clears throat> I'm I'm looking at the at year 2020. <clears throat> Looks pretty amazing. Um, so, am I correct in assuming when I read annual effective rate of return on market value of assets? and it says 28.1. Does that literally mean that our, that our total pension fund assets increased by 28%? I'm not looking at which yeah. page. Or, I, page I, four. We did, 2020 was a, a very good well, year. Well, I mean, it's an I outlier. It was it's probably it's, the it's in a level of tenfold from the year before. And we see 28, I mean, our investment return assumption 7.1%. And I see an annual effective rate of return on market value of assets, not actuarial value. Right, right. And it says 28.1 percent. Did our our fund earn 28 percent that year? Yes. yes. So if our fund was 100 million dollars in 2019, it was 128 million dollars in 2020. That was an example using 28 percent. Say Tim, I think. Yeah, right? it was. I I'm just say, I mean, if you want, I think we probably started that year at, we made $50 million that year. Okay, great. I'm reading it right. It, That's all I want to know but, is I'm reading it right. But it's paper made because we're not actually. Oh, I understand that. <laughs> yep, I just, um, you know, I'm trying to get a handle on, I've been reading these things forever, trying to get a handle on actuarial accrued liability, market value assets, benefit payments, you know, all these different lines. And I know you have to average things out. Um, but we see a, quite a banner year. Was there any change in the investment strategies in 2019 that led to that type of, let's say, ridiculous return in 2020, happily? I think and why did, they, why did that change in 2021? I think the commission, uh, I'll, I'll go first, Gary. I think the commission has taken um, a deliberate and long-term strategic approach as opposed to trying to be tactical. And so with tactical 
the, the term tactical, but what I mean by that is trying to time markets. Right. So we have a, there's a set asset allocation target, and as markets perform well or certain asset classes perform well, we tend to reduce those back down to target because they're outperforming and reallocate those proceeds to the underperforming asset classes. Sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but over time it actually works and helps keep the risk profile intact. When we get a good year like the one you referred to or we get a difficult year like 2022, um, we know we're going to have years on either ends of the extremes, but the pension has a very long life, and one of the benefits of a long life portfolio is you have the ability to weather storms like that. If you can justify the allocation, you'll get to where you want to be. And as you pointed out, the 10-year return is about a little over 7%, which is right where the uh, actuaries have us targeted at. And that, and that a performance year, was, was that pretty... Uh, Unit standard across the country? Sim similar to the way 2022 was a, a mid-teen negative return was common. That was, same, that was the case as well. So that's what the market provided. Okay. Maybe there was a little bit of outperformance uh, potentially. Right. But it really, so it did, not, it did not reflect the change in investment strategies uh, to any great degree. Um, it wasn't a change, a major change in anything the commission is doing, from an, or you're doing, handling the money. It was just, it was a good year for all of the types of investments we've, that make up our portfolio. For a simple I would say understanding. Yes. I mean, I think everybody wants to take credit for the good years and yeah, right. you know, disown the bad ones. Right. Um, but I would just say the strategy, uh, as Mr. Trangisi pointed out, is to participate on the upside and hopefully participate a little less on the downside. Yeah. Some years, and certainly I would say the last 10 years, have been especially challenging for public pension funds because uh, interest rates on fixed income have been so low. And that's, first of all, it's cash flow yield is, is a critical element of this to pay benefits as they're due. And second of all, that is kind of the foundation for all the other returns. So you'd like to get to seven by being around seven every year and not be 22 some years and down 14 or 15 other years, which is why, you know, the real world, that's what happens. So in the, you know, what we try to do and what we have been doing, at least, uh, I think increasingly, at least since I've been around, is to diversify the portfolio so that there are less, you know, there's no inordinately bad years or that hopefully we lose less than the market is offering. And, and I believe you explained that the actuarial, uh, firm um, makes their recommendations on long-term averaging, correct? In other words, they saw, well, oh well, my what goodness, they, you made what $50 they million dollars in 2020, you don't have to put any money in 2021. Right, they would not do that. Well, right. what they, they do, they if you think that. about right. it, it's like keeping score, right? Every yeah. year, if you have your bogey set at seven and you make eight, you, you have a 1% actuarial gain, that 1%, whatever the dollar amount is, gets divided by five and allocated to each of those years. The next year, you underperform by 4%. They take that amount, divide it by five, and spread it over all the years. So you basically have a number of different variances being you know, allocated to each year. So it's kind of a mix. Uh, but you know, because as you can imagine, 7%, you, know, you never really hit your bogey. You're always above or below, and this smoothing, again, the smoothing isn't intended to do anything except make it more manageable from a budgetary standpoint to maintain the funding. And that's in that um, recommended uh, contribution is designed to weather all of those ups and downs. Well, it incorporates consideration. And still, and still get you to a point which we've determined is about 24 years down the road where we'd be back to 100% funding. Right, and, and to some extent, again, this gets way out past my actuarial yeah. capabilities, but um, you know, what you're trying to do, uh, I guess, is not every, so the liabilities in the pension fund, not all of them are due. You know, people are still working, and, and, but you, we are, this, the town is putting money away for those people when they retire at, at what they estimate they're going to earn. So that's some of the reason why you would never be, well, you generally, it's hard to be 100% funded because you're actually, you know, 
putting away money now to pay for things that will become due in the future. By the same token, you're paying for benefits now that were earned 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So um, that that's part of, the, so in then what the actuaries do, and it's mind numbing, you know, but it's in here, is uh, there are many estimates and there are many assumptions, but they're based on, you know, uh, what we'd say, uh, rational expectations. And just so the prior years, percentage of payroll was 24.4. So it only went, so that's how the, even though we had that bad year with the smoothing, it really wasn't that big of an increase for the town's contribution. And lastly, we have, we have switched, have we not, um, with our newest employees? Isn't this a plan that is for all employees that have been in place so new and their survivors and all new employees are in different plans? So no, the new, new hires are still part of the pension plan. It's just a different form of pension. And I, I would have to defer to the HR. It's, it's called a cash balance plan. Right. So they don't get, so when I retire, there's a formula, and I'm going to get that a month for the rest of my life. That's not open to employees anymore. Now, a percentage of their payroll gets put in. They, a percentage of their pay gets put in. The town matches, puts in the 24.8 percent as well and then whatever was attributed to that employee when they retire gets paid out as an annuity but I'm the HR director or would be better off explaining that that's just my understanding of it so but so there the plan is not closed to new employees they just have a different plan I yeah I didn't word it properly but what isn't isn't that isn't the objective to reduce the long-term liabilities the town has? It, it will, but it's going to take a while. Because the way you made it sound, <laughs> the way you made it sound, they're going to get the same pension, but more money because they put some more of their own money in it. No, they're, that's they're, not how it's going to work. That's not how it's going to work, but the town yeah. still has to put in, even though the new employees, we still have to put in 24.8 of that salary. That's part of the trying to catch up I got you. to that 75%. You know, that's how we're trying. So theoretically, to those, those, the numbers that you're speaking about, the contributions would theoretically be higher if we never made the changes we've made in the last several years and everybody was still on this original old-fashioned pension plan. Correct. Well, for the most part, I don't think we expect to see much in the way of reduced costs for 25 to 30 years. And I think, is that correct, Jim? Before, before there's any real reduction in pension costs, pension costs it's probably 25 or 30 years it's a generational thing uh, probably 30 40 years from now um, the way that the cash balance plan works is it's uh, by the IRS code it's considered a defined benefit plan but the benefit for the cash balance plan is based on what is in their cash balance at the, the end of their career and then the annuity if they elect to go that route is based upon the cash balance uh, value at the point of retirement. Traditional defined benefit plan, you can calculate today what your benefit is going to be 30 years from now. And you could be pretty much pretty close in terms of what that's going to be. With the cash balance plan, it's a reduced benefit because it's going to be based upon the cash balance. It's going to be based upon the age of the annuitant if they go the annuity route. They can take a lump sum of payment, too. It's going to be based upon their age, the age of a dependent, if, in fact, they have one. So there's a lot of variables that are going to go into that cash balance, uh, the annuity. But it's going to be less. But it's you know, going to be based upon the cash balance account, the age of the annuitant, and the, uh, the age of the dependent, if, in fact, they have one. Councillor Carmody. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, Jim, Jim 
touched on something that I was going to ask. The, this cash balance plan is still a defined benefit plan. That's correct. Has the commission or the administration at any point, you know, discussed or, or looked into implementing a defined contribution plan for new hires? So many years ago when we began to look, when uh, Terry Sullivan was the personnel director, he began to look at a defined contribution plan. Uh, the costs associated with that were looked at as being uh, higher because we'd also have to be contributing to Social Security. We'd have to get a, dis a death and disability benefit um, that was outside the plan. So when we looked at the cash balance plan, we looked at the advent uh, uh, the advantages of that were that the money would go into the same pot, right? The money would go into the consolidated pension plan, the contributions for the cash balance plan, and employees who are in the cash balance plan, though it's a diminished benefit, they also have a death and disability benefit that comes right out of the plan. We didn't have to go buy one in the open market. And, and for you, are you seeing other municipalities looking at defined contribution plans at all? We, uh, many municipalities have uh, defined contribution plans either in place of a defined benefit plan or complementary to. Um, I will say that cash, a cash balance plan ha is, uh, in, in many circumstances, more attractive. It has some more attractive features depending on its structure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions or comments from the public? Well, there being none, thank you both for your time. Thank you. On to item seven, which is discussion regarding traffic concerns and sidewalks on Johnson Road. We have uh, the police chief and deputy returning, and we have media. Councilor Testa, this is also your item. Thank you. Hello again, Chief. Hello. Um, as uh, I'm sure Chief recalls, although the agenda item seems specific to one issue, uh, there were multiple concerns I brought up to be discussed, and I know the Chief is aware of them all. So. I'll probably hit you with a lot of questions about other things, but I, I uh, for the sake of the public and my colleagues, uh, I had asked for an agenda item to discuss this and uh, mentioned concerns I've received from multiple people about different issues with speed problems around town. Certainly the Johnson Road issue was a request for a sidewalk and then there were some others that came up, and the chief informed me that he happened to be in the middle of a rather in-depth study. Um, so we, we held off until that was ready because it would be appropriate to allow him and his, his staff to make that presentation. So um, I guess the best thing to do is to hear from you, and then you know, we can ask the questions about the specific, other specific issues afterwards. So I thank you very much for all the work and getting in touch with me and asking me to hold off so you could be better prepared for this. Thank you. So obviously we've all seen post-COVID that the traffic behaviors, the uh, driving behaviors of individuals, not just respective to Wallingford, but you know the entire state and country has progressively gotten worse. Um, Reckless driving, erratic driving, and speed, you know, is something that we've been dealing with in the town. So we have a, a few things um, within our department to try to measure some of the uh, speeds in town, and that's what we did. So obviously, the, you know, the stats from NHTSA shows that, you know, since 2020, there has been a vast increase in roadway deaths. Uh, if you look at the State of Connecticut, uh, through the Yukon uh, crash uh, repository in 2023, there's already been 71 fatalities on the roadways. 
Um, they are projecting that 2023 will end um, with more deaths than 2022, which was at 383 fatalities for the state of Connecticut. So it is a concern. You know, in our town, we've seen some pretty severe crashes uh, since uh, people started coming back from COVID, and a lot of it is speed related. So when we talk about Johnson Road, so you know, we utilize a lot of different tools to, to try to gauge uh, where our issues are. So one of those is the Yukon Crash Repository. So basically every single accident that we investigate is entered into this database. So what you see here is a seven year um, representation of accidents in the area of Highland Ave and Johnson Road. So um, in seven years in that particular intersection, there are five um, crashes or collisions. None of them um, would be deemed to be serious. There are no fatalities, but there are five incidents of uh, motor vehicle collisions in that direct area. So when you look at speed analysis, what we ended up doing is we used three uh, methods to measure speed within town. So everyone's seen the speed logic um, readouts, which basically is that flashing speedometer sign. When you drive by, it tells you exactly what you know, speed you're traveling. We also have the speed trailer, which is um, a little more antiquated, but uh, still effective. And then we have what is called a covert um, system where we run a line across the roadway and you, the motorist cannot see that, that would be the most accurate um, depiction of speed because obviously uh, when you know that someone's measuring your speed, you may choose to slow down. So that prevents that because you really can't recognize that. Uh, that system actually is in such high demand that we are um, putting in a capital item or we have put in a capital item to purchase an additional one. But what you see here is pre-COVID, you know, September 24th to 27th, 2018, we did measure the speed on Highland Ave because we have received multiple complaints from that area uh, regarding speed. And it, it's tough because it is, you know, the roadway construction and also that you are going down a decline or an incline, depending on which way you're going, it, it affects the speed. But if you see here in 2018 and, and the end of September, we did a study uh, in which 7,073 cars pass through that speed area on Highland Ave, uh, which is really in the area that Johnson Road area that uh, it's kind of like the midpoint of Highland. So of those 7,073 cars that were measured on a posted speed limit of 30 miles an hour, the average speed actually was below the posted, which was 28 miles an hour on an average speed. The maximum speed was 55 miles an hour on that roadway during that time, uh, time period. If you fast forward to 2022, um, out of 20,792 cars that traveled in that area, um, the average speed was 31 miles an hour on a posted 30, but the maximum speed was 72 miles an hour. That box that was up there was a readout box, so it was uh, either a speed trailer box. So what ends up happening, unfortunately, when you do utilize that type of traffic um, measurement is that people try to intentionally make that number look pretty high. Um, you know, we've had a, a traffic box on Route 68 get to 132 miles an hour. So people do attempt to try to play around, which is extremely dangerous because it, that area is dangerous in the roadway construction. So it's not something that we suggest, and, and it can cause serious injury. But that those maximum speed numbers, that's one car, and that's what, you know, really would indicate what you're looking at as far as why that's so high. But overall, the average speed was 31 miles an hour. Um, this is utilizing the speed trailer box again, uh, October of 2022, we put it back out and the maximum speed at that point was 62 miles an hour with an average speed of 36 miles per hour. So what you see on the bottom, the 85th percentile speed, basically that's the measurement of what 85% of all vehicles that travel on that roadway are at. So the 85th percentile speed or 85% of all motorists that were traveling on that roadway during that time period were traveling at 41 miles an hour. If you look at November 28th to December 11th of 2022, this is kind of around the time um, that we had that pedestrian struck. That's why you have so many printouts. We wanted to gauge really what the speeds were in that area. Um, what you see is that of the average speed was 34 miles an hour. Again, that 85th percentile speed is at 40 on the posted 30 miles an hour. So most people traveling that roadway are traveling 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. 
then lastly, uh, in March, this is the one that we had just recently did. Uh, you see that from March 6th to March 27th, we had 24,016 cars travel in that Highland area in front of Johnson Road. And what you have is 33 miles per hour was the average speed and the 80th percentile speed was 38 miles an hour. So that came down two miles an hour. Just as comparison, I had spoken with uh, Councilor Zandri about some speeding issues in that South Main Street area. So we were, able, we were able to put the speed trailer up for 11 days. So in 11 days, 17,751 cars traveled on the South Main area. The maximum speed recorded was 64 miles an hour with an average speed of 29 miles an hour in a posted 30. And then lastly, on North Main Street, um, right in the front of the library, the traffic logic um, readout was, was put up there. 120,752 cars traveled in that area between August 29th and October 2nd. And if you look at the right-hand side that's highlighted, 15,422 cars traveled at that 31 to 35 mile an hour range. And your average speeds, if you look throughout the times, are well below the posted 30 mile an hour speed limit. Um, so we get to this point. So the, the average person thinks that an effective uh, basically deterrence for speeding would be a police officer on the side of the road. So that, that kind of is the, the normal um, response. They call up the traffic division, our cars go out there, we stay there for a couple hours and we leave. That really doesn't correct aggressive behavior, right? So it's a deterrence for the time that we're there, but it doesn't really correct any, any behaviors that, that might come about from motorists. So traffic calming recommendations are, some towns have a traffic calming plan. It's, it's things that they do to look at the roadways within town in an, an effort to, to slow the speeds down. You know, New Haven's a great example. Down in that Chapel Street area by Yale Bowl, they're having uh, severe issues with speeding and they redesigned the roadway to try to bring the speeds down. Um, the deputy will tell you why officers on the side of the road doing speed enforcement is not really effective these days. Well, I mean, it predominantly goes to the fact that uh, officers on the side of the road are having more and more difficult time uh, pulling out into traffic. It's, it's, it's really that simple. It's getting very, very dangerous as traffic. I mean, we did see a, a dip in traffic due to COVID, but traffic is really on the increase again. Um, and the areas where we're having these issues are, are commonly congested areas. You take uh, Route 68, as for instance, you, you take Route 5, doing traffic uh, speed enforcement. You can get closer to the doing mic, Doing speed please. enforcement Thank on you. these roadways. I kind of do that every time I'm up here. Um, doing speed enforcement on those roadways is very, very difficult, um, both in the terrain, because it's difficult for the officers to secrete themselves or even to get into an area where they can effectively manage the tools that they use, which is a radar or a laser. Um, and as one is one is perpendicular to the roadway, one is one is this way. So, um, and and if you can get a good accurate read on a vehicle, uh, then it becomes difficult to get out and catch these vehicles, especially as speeds are increasing. Um, so it's so it becomes very difficult. Other reasons are um, uh, due to changes in, in in laws and changes in pursuit policies throughout the state of Connecticut and the nation. Um, you know. The bad actors are aware that the police are not really going to chase them, so to speak. Um, so we can't get out there and, and start chasing cars for speeding violations. It's just too dangerous these days. We actually had to create an incident code um, in, our, in our agency just to start logging this because it was becoming such a, it, it's just become a trend. Um, since March, I think we started in March 1st of this year, we've had uh, approximately 10 uh, cars that have taken off on on traffic, attempts at traffic stops. Now that doesn't include uh, those officers that are trying to stop, say a shoplifter that's taken off from Walmart or uh, a stolen vehicle that just takes off or any other type of crime, simply from a motor vehicle stop, they just fail to, they just won't pull over and yield to the lights. So um, with these trends, that typical cop on the side of the road is just becoming less and less and less effective. So um, traffic calming is, is, is one way. And, and there are others. But. And it's not, you know, to, to put these out is just for discussion purposes. There's nothing that I support or don't support. It's just to make the council aware of what uh, other municipalities are kind of looking to do uh, in reference to, to curbing some of the speeds in town. So 
it, it deals a lot with roadway designs. It's to, to design the roadway in a manner in which would s slow the traffic down by the topography of the roadway. So um, chicanes are one way to do so. It's basically um, adding curves into the roadway, which forces the cars to have to adjust the way that they, they drive, but also reduces the manner in which uh, the, the speed that they travel, because you cannot effectively travel the roadway uh, at, a, at an elevated speed. So if you look at it, uh, their curves are lane shifts. It forces the motorists to steer back and forth instead of traveling straight. Straight path always will indicate speeds that are a lot higher, Route 68, for example. Um, in a 2017 uh, cost analysis, and it's obviously higher now, you're looking anywhere between eight and $25,000 uh, to put uh, this system in. Curb extensions are something that's extremely popular. Um, curb ex extensions are exactly what it sounds. They, it's to um, adjust the roadway in a manner in which you push the curbs out into the travel lanes to basically narrow down the, the path of travel and, and thus slowing down the vehicles um, here's an example of an, an actual, the one that was done with a crosswalk incorporated into it. But if you um, look at the dollar figures, it's somewhere between 1500 and 20000 depending on the width of the barrier. But um, it's, the curb extensions, or, or what they also refer to as a choker, is a, is a very effective way of kind of slowing down traffic. I mean, the roadway does not allow for the speed to occur because of the, the way that it's designed. Median Islands is something that's popular. That's what was done in uh, New Haven on Chapel Street. That it, it, It's a manner of funneling the cars through an area, um, narrowing the roadway at certain pinch points on the, on the uh, actual travel portion of the roadway. And it, it prevents you know, cars from driving fast because you have diverters and barriers. So that will run you somewhere between $1,500 and $10,000. Um, in, in cost, you know, five years ago. So obviously, like I said, it's, it's a little higher now. Speed humps, a lot of people um, want speed humps. I, we, I get a lot of requests that people want speed humps in their areas. Um, for a, a, a New England town, it's very hard to put speed humps in because of multiple reasons. One, it's hard to plow. Uh, the plows have to raise up when they get to that area. It, but more importantly, emergency vehicles need to slow down uh, when they approach just because of, of the, the manner in which they're traveling and the speed humps, they, they do not mix, so it could create a lot of uh, safety concerns for first responders. So a lot of places try to stay away from the speed humps. Something I did not put in here, but uh, is being utilized in a lot of other municipalities are basically three-dimensional speed humps. They're just painted into the roadway, but actually are not raised. It gives the appearance that there's a speed hump there, which forces the motorist thinking that there's a speed hump ahead to slow down, uh, and that's an effective uh, means of, of slowing some of the traffic down. Raised intersections, again, it's just changing the roadway topography to uh, make, the, make the driver slow down. When they see that they're approaching something that's different than what the actual roadway they're traveling on is, it forces, you know, mentally to make the person uh, slow down, thinking that there's a hazard ahead. Uh, same with, um, Crosswalks too. They usually do raise. You could do a raised crosswalk, so it makes someone mentally think that they need to slow down, uh, and it's also effective in slowing speeds down. But it's also a very cost costly uh, endeavor to do. Things that are going on in our state actually now is there's red light cameras that are being proposed. There's there's legislation that's going through. Um, Waterbury is looking to be the, a test city for red light cameras. So basically, uh, intersections are controlled by cameras in which uh, if you are caught in between the cameras after a red light occurs, it'll take a picture of your license plate. It's effective and it's not effective because if you have a misuse of plates on your car or no plate at all, obviously you're not going to be able to, to do anything to that driver. So, you know, if you take care of your car, and it's the whole concept of our, even our officers. It's very hard to ticket somebody that's doing the right thing and, and maybe, you know, driving to work and is going a little fast and pulls over and give them a $300 ticket opposed to the person that's driving erratically and takes off on us. So, that, you know, it's, it, it's extremely hard as far as discretion goes in dealing with some of those things. But red light cameras are effective. You know that it's there, it's arbitrary, and it's not, it's not going to, to lie. If you go through the intersection on a red, it's going to take your picture. Um, same thing with speed cameras. If you've been watching the news lately, the state of Connecticut are installing speed cameras at different work zones. Um, 
speed cameras can be used in town. Uh, you would just have to really, you know, as a council, think about is that what we would like to do? Um, it is intrusive. Uh, you would have to, the state of Connecticut basically sets uh, the speed of which they would take your picture as you're traveling. Uh, if you watch the 50 miles an hour is what they're gonna, they are going to propose to enforce uh, work zone speeds and they also have a, a fine schedule. So first offense would result in a written warning with no fine, second offense would result in a notice of liability along with a $75 fine and every other offense after that will result in a $150 fine. So that's what the state of Connecticut uh, proposed uh, in their new pilot program that uh, should be rolled out um, actually I think within the next week or so if it's not already active. And then lastly, our neighbors uh, in Cheshire and a lot of other towns are going to these fixed license plate readers. Um, Flock Safety is a, a leading company that uh, proposes or, or that constructs these fixed license plate readers. Basically, you, um, you know, Cheshire's employing them to deal with stolen vehicles. So when you come into town, you can set the, the system to identify license plates that may be stolen or recently stolen or have alerts on them for various reasons and it alerts the officers in the field immediately that the car is in town. So there's a lot of towns that are starting to go to these unmanned uh, systems that are result, you know, kind of relying on technology more so than, you know, officers on the road enforcing traffic laws. So with that, uh, if any questions, we're, we're here to answer them for you. So the fixed license plate meter caught my attention. If you're, you find out there's a stolen car in town, you engage in pursuit. It seems likely to me that nobody's going to stop. Correct. And, and I think that my counterpart in Cheshire, Chief Dreyf, I think his logic in install, installing the cameras was that it would alert the officers to the fact of a stolen car has entered into the town, the location of where it is, and then give the officers a head start basically in getting to the area and then employing some sort of countermeasure. I mean, in most cases, it's going to be stop sticks or a piranha system to deflate the tires, but if that's not effective, then you know you're not going to you're not going to chase that vehicle unless you have an ex, you know uh, extenuating circumstance that allows you to do so. Thank you, Councillor Zandri. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, gentlemen. So yeah, you I, you and I have had plenty of conversations about this, and we've talked about the speed humps before and the positives and negatives and how we how we those don't really work. But well, they don't work for us up here because of because of the weather and the controls and so forth. I, I guess my, my question would be, I, I, I like the idea of the, split, the license plate readers for, for the, the discussion that was just had. It gives, a, it gives the police an opportunity to maybe be strategic about some action or activity that they might be able to take. I'm curious about the, the speed cameras and the red light cameras because much to the point that you made, you know, there, there's, there's not a lot of discussion. And how, how do those cameras work to the element of car can't be guilty of something. It has to be the driver. So how does that break down when the ticket goes to the person's car and their address, the owner of the car, but I mean, what, what is the burden of the individual to say, well, I wasn't driving the car that day? Well, how, how does that play? And the reason, the reason I ask this question is, you know, as we consider you know, options that, that we might want to fund or, or work in conjunction, I know people are going to come back and say, well, you know, what if my brother is borrowing my car? Do I have to pay that ticket? And do I have to, you know, get a lawyer to deal with the ticket that I wasn't driving the car? And I don't like that idea. So, I mean, help me explain that to Joe on the street. Right, and then that is the issue. Um, and like I said, there's a lot, you know, they're effective, but I don't know if I necessarily agree with all of them. Um, but to that point, yes, so the registered owner would, would receive the ticket and then it would be up to that individual to then have to go to traffic court and fight the ticket because we really couldn't verify at that point uh, if their story is correct because it's not our, once the ticket is, is issued, I mean, it's really not our problem. But now you just burden somebody with having to go to court. So I, I see that point and that's why I'm not 100% sold on those two programs. I know that they can be effective to the you know, law-abiding citizen that sees the camera go up, um, they're gonna slow down, but more so to the people that don't care or not 
car is not properly registered or insured, it's not going to be effective because there's no way that you're ever, you know, they would ever be held accountable. So if you had, you know, you, you gave us, you know, this, this laundry, if you could get funding, whatever, ARPA funding, we find a bag of money on the ground, what would you want to deploy in town to try to calm down, calm the traffic and calm the speeds? If we had money that could be spent, I think that purchasing more speed enforcement uh, traffic logic uh, like we put up on South Main Street, some of the more co more covert, uh, covert uh, systems um, to start out with, because I, I, the last thing I think that we as a police department want to be is intrusive to the public, right? That's not what we want to do, but we do want to prevent roadway collisions. So, you know, to start out with, I think we need more of those um, traffic logic boxes, but they are not cheap. And some of those boxes, they help us allocate our resources appropriately. So. Um, a lot of these boxes, some of them you don't even know that are up there recording speeds. Um, and perception of speed is different than reality. A lot of people say, you know, these guys are flying down my road at 65 miles an hour. And, and in reality, it's really not happening. And we, we use these tools a lot of times to get out there, especially the covert tools, and we place them out there. And then we, the reality we find is that you have your average speeds and your 85th percentile speeds, which are generally not much more than 10 miles an hour over the speed limit and you really don't have a speeding issue in a particular area, you have a perception of, of a speed issue. Obviously, in some areas, you do have a speed issue. Getting back to your other point with the, um, with the red light camera, we, we uh, had that issue with um, the Red Flex program where we had um, cameras on school buses, and it was, it was, I guess it must have been codified in, in the statute where the registered owner, it, it's, it's on the registered owner, and the onus is on that person to, to prove that they weren't the operator of the vehicle. That, ticket went to the registered owner because it's only capturing that data right. and there were many tickets that we had to just discard um, where you had a clear violation because it was a, mis a misuse sometimes it's out of state how are you gonna go write tickets to people out of state and expect them to show up in court here in here in Connecticut so there are problems with the programs like that with the, with the cameras but um, I, I think they're pretty effective they were at least on school buses they're effective and I think they would be effective here you know as a major deterrent if nothing else yeah, I don't want to discount yeah. anything. I just, I just know, you know, what kind of response I'll get from people as I talk to them. Couple, couple quick more things. So, we, when we were talking on the phone on the one that was up on South Main, you indicated that was about two thousand dollars a unit. Those, correct. And we received three um, of those systems from the state of Connecticut for free on a grant, which we have now that the weather is warmer. We have all three of them deployed right now. Um, but I would like you know, a lot more because I think that they would be effective in some areas in town. So when you say a lot more, like, so your, your, your mind is if I could, again, find a bag of money and I know of 20 locations I would put them, 50 locations I would put them, what do you? I think that we would identify, you know, based off our, you know, the complaints that we receive in the traffic division, some of the stats that we have using our selective enforcement program that we would identify the roadways that would need it the most and then deploy them into those areas. And then we can keep them there for a, a longer period of time because the ones that we have in a grant, they're recording data for the state and for ourselves. So we have to move them every you know, couple months. I think it's every two months we have to put them in a new location. So if we're able to purchase some our, on our own, we can uh, put them in, in roadways which we would not have to move. Um, and we can get the readouts and see if we're being effective you know, in using the system. And if not, we can move the cameras somewhere else or reposition them, either northbound or southbound, and try to get a better um, result and you you talked about the covert ones those are the ones that are hidden so you're capturing the actual speed so would you favor those or the ones that that have you know a readout I mean I would I, I guess I see the pros and cons of both you know there's there's always going to be somebody that sees the readout and like you said they want to clock a clock a nice speed for themselves and then there's other people that are like oop I didn't know I was going that fast and they back off which which one do you think is more effective for calming the traffic so in calming the traffic would be the, the feedback uh, sign because you actually see what you're, you're going. You know, the light changes colors. It is recording you know, speeds to give us an idea. And you know, for the people that are driving, you know, they, they more than likely will slow down. Um, when you can't see the, the, the use of the covert system is if we had a complaint of, of speed, like the deputy was saying, the best way to determine whether or not that the speeds are accurate, because we do get calls from people saying, you know, people are going 50, 60 miles an hour down my roadway. And you deploy that system, and you get a truly accurate depiction of what the speeds are. So no one knows that it's there. And if you get a readout of you know, an average speed of 30 miles an hour, you can you know, assume that that's pretty accurate. Um, 
not saying that the feedback systems are not accurate, but if you truly want a, a precise number or, or average of a speed, that was what I would use. But if you want a deterrent, I would use the feedback systems because it does you know, register something to the driver that they should slow down or give them some sort of response. And I, and I think there's a, an add-on to that. So if, you know, if, you're, if you're two or three cars, you know, there might be 10 car lengths between you, but as one slows down, the next one does too. And you might have someone that might otherwise target the sign, but they're not going anywhere. There's two people in front of them. So I, I think there's an advantage to that too. All right, th those were my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Testa. Thank you. And th thank you, Chief, Deputy Chief. Those are, that was a great uh, report. A lot of things to think about. Um, I'm going to move to South Main Street for a moment because I had received um, had a lengthy discussion with somebody about that. Uh, it appears that uh, maybe, I don't know, for whatever it was the last four or five years, more and more people are choosing to use South Main Street uh, where you can hop on it, John Street. You know, executive is a little, little swerve. Now you're at the bottom. And really using that as a speedway to get up to the center of town. And he, was, he and many of his neighbors who have been there for 50 years, very concerned about that. And they've seen it. And I'm sure you've, you said you've measured there. Now again, their perception of the actual speeds may not be what um, match up with reality completely. But he was asking for something that could be done. And I was listening to what you were talking about. What he was asking for plainly is a possible four-way stop at Cedar Street. I know we've, you've put in four-way stops. I know on my, I, I'm on South Elm. So we've gotten that stop sign at high, the bottom of High Street, for example, the bottom of North Street. And again, because that on top of everything else, it, it has, it's the road leading to all of the Choate crossings. But for everybody, um, and they're, they're not, you know, I'm, I'm, that's my road. So, you know, using at least twice a day, going back and forth to work. And there, it's not a tremendous inconvenience. Um, so I thought for a stop sign at Cedar might be worth considering. And I don't know where we go from here. I ask you, you say whatever. Um, right. But then you mentioned the medium, median barriers and other type of structural things that might uh, narrow the road a little bit and lead to people slowing down. So I guess I'm just going to plant that seed of seeing if there's something that might be done South Main Street in that Cedar Street area for those folks that we're talking about it, because that is a main road, and you know people are using that as a, a bypass. Right. And what you see, I think, is that commercial business is great, right? It's great for the tax roll. It's great for, for us, you know, and be able to do things. But what it also does is it increases traffic. We have a lot of commercial business on South Colony Road. We have a lot of commercial business on North Colony Road. But the choke points, uh, especially at that center and, and uh, North Colony area, um, as you get down a little on Christian Street and you go towards, you know, um, Yale Ave, which at points of the day you can't even travel down I mean the commercial business chokes that traffic so everyone uses North Main and South Main as a cut through because it's easier to kind of divert yourself and not have to deal with the traffic lights at Ward Street or even at you know five so it increases traffic we have seen that um, in the smaller residential neighborhoods that usually are not accustomed to a lot of traffic flow because of the increase in commercial uh, it is now increasing that that uh, number of traffic, uh, you know, the vehicles that are traveling in that area. So when you put stop signs, you have to be careful because A, people are not used to traveling in that area with a controlled uh, intersection, so it can actually lead to, to motor vehicle collisions, but also it might back traffic up worse than what it's already at, so we would have to look at that. Roadway, you know, redesigning the roadways are effective. It's not cheap, um, but it is something that's extremely effective, especially no, moving forward, I think in the state of Connecticut, you know, we deal with the uh, the T2 center up in uh, the state of Connecticut, and they come out and they kind of do some roadway evaluations, and a lot of the recommendations that they have these days are actually redesigning some of your roadways, which can just naturally slow down traffic. Well, I think, you, and you've reinforced the concern by acknowledging that because of more and more congestion on Route 5, that is a, a very 
easy bypass for folks. Um, and I think given the, the gain they might think they're going to get from not having to get hooked up at all those lights, uh, they could be slowed down a little bit and still come out ahead. Um, I'd like us to look into trying to do something on the South Main in that Cedar area if possible. Um, maybe, you know, maybe we'll talk about it down the road. Um, the Johnson Road, I shared the letter. This was all initiated partly because of that letter I received from a constituent. And she wants sidewalks. Um, and that brings us to the administration and, and engineering and everyone else. But, you know, Johnson Road is behind Sheehan and off of Highland. And so it is, along with Gregory, you pointed it out. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, a lot of kids coming out of the parking lot at school are using that road. I think a lot of trucks and vehicles going to the school are using that road. Um, and it's, she's just brought up multiple examples of uh, people on lawns hitting sidewalks, hitting this. And it's just very, very nerve wracking for those folks. And their children are walkers to Highland. And um, her request was really simple. Can we please get sidewalks on Johnson and Gregory because of the traffic mostly generated by the school? And I'm not sure how we would go about that. Um, now of course, we can probably hold off a little bit because it, it's always possible it could become a moot point depending on what happens with the schools, but I don't want these two things to interfere. I would like to, to know what the possibility would be. What is, first of all, what, is, what are your feelings on that? Sidewalks are safe. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sidewalks uh, allow the pedestrian traffic to, to operate in, a, in a, you know, an area that's safe, right? It's designed to walk. It's not in the street. It's not you know, in, the, in the travel lane or off the travel lane in, in the shoulder of the roadway. It's a, spe you know, a specific area in which you know, pedestrian traffic is diverted to. So as a safety point, um, we have no issues with it. It gets a little more complicated, I think, past that. But right. you know, from a safety standpoint, sidewalks are the safest uh, route for not only pedestrians but bicyclists and anyone else looking to travel in that area and not be in the roadway. Well, having having looked at those roads specifically, um, and keeping in mind that school children have to walk to school along those roads, would you say that there's a, le a legitimate argument to be made that? sidewalks could be called for yeah, and, and on above and beyond the obvious um, benefit that sidewalks are certainly safer than walking in the road right. but there might be a more of a need there given the traffic flow would you say that's it it's a busy area and it's a narrow roadway it doesn't yeah. leave you much room on the uh, you know the shoulder portion of the roadway to, to walk and I think that was a contributing factor to the pedestrian struck in that area back in September of last year right. um, so I personally think that it, it is safe. Um, a lot more goes into the construction of sidewalks, you know, especially in um, residential areas. So I would, I would punt that to yeah. the engineering and the mayor. But um, as far as a safety standpoint, yes, that's something that it, it would increase the safety because it's unsafe to, to walk in the roadway, obviously. Um, Highland Avenue is, an, is a town road, correct? Correct. OK. Um, my, my last point, which probably warrants a, a separate agenda discussion, um, is a request I received from several people about implementing school speed zones around town. And I don't know off the top of my head if we have any. Um, there was a bunch, I'll share this information from the state with you. Um, I wouldn't expect you to make any um, value judgments on it this evening. But I received a bunch of information that the state has put, into, put together um, that about measures that can be taken in areas immediately around all schools. I believe the way the law is, and, and it, it involves um, increased fines, lower speed limits, uh, certainly all the type of measures and then some that you've spoken about when we talk about reducing traffic. But in general, what would you foresee the procedure to be if we were to 
go down that path. Say, let's try to implement special school speed zones around the Highland School area, around all of our schools, basically. What would that entail? So we would have to do a another department. <laughs> no, we could do that. I mean, we would have to do a traffic study again to just uh -huh. kind of get how many vehicles travel in that area. I mean, we'd probably leave the the system in for a pretty prolonged period of time to get us a, an exact number. Um, and we need we need an average speed, obviously. But you know, as an LTA, I can set the speed limits. The, the state legislature changed the traffic laws to which I can set the speed limits in town. Um, in working with uh, the state of Connecticut, so I think that. Once we establish what the speed is currently, we can sit down and see what we like the speed to be. But then in doing so, we also have to make sure that the area is marked um, accordingly, you know, there's specific signs and, and things within the roadway itself that need to be done um, before you can enact that speed. But you know, it's something that we can look at for all the schools. I know that in the Sheehan area, there are um, you know, sp school ahead or whatever the speed zone may be, but you know, as far as, the roadways, a lot of our roadways are older. They can be remarked. Um, it helps. I mean, I know we were talking about uh, the intersection that showed at North Elm and Christian. I mean, that can use, you know, we, we've said that they could use uh, some paint because the brighter it is and the more that people can look at it and, and see that there's something ahead, it does force you to slow down. So, yeah, I mean, it's something that we can look at. Yeah, about three years ago, maybe even four years ago now, all the uh, pedestrian signs in all, in all the schools in, in the town were uh, updated um, with the newer uh, styled signs with the with the updated coloring it's slightly on, on the microphone please slightly different from that traditional yellow it's a it's a little bit little bit different it's probably going to be a lifelong habit until I retire I'm sorry <laughs> well what I will do is I'll forward to you and obviously everybody here in the administration the document that was forwarded to me from the state by representative Mashinsky as a matter of fact which outlined uh, the whole program, measures that can be taken, and, uh, and then you can, you know, and we'll talk about it again at a later date. I would appreciate that. Uh, thanks for your indulgence, everybody. And uh, be talking further with the administration about sidewalks on Johnson and Gregory. Uh, maybe you can let me know down the road, let us know down the road what we might be able to do on South Main Street and that Cedar Street area, and the rest is to be determined as well. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman. Councillor Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good evening, gentlemen. Um, any idea what was going on November 30th of 2022 that would indicate the spike that I see on the data on Highland? Is the, the numbers... Um, For instance, um, and we're talking about 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. On Monday, it was 176. On Tuesday, it was 194. On Wednesday, it was 454. And it goes back to 169. At a school event, that's kind of approximately. Either a school event or it could have been the football game, Powder Puff. Um, I, I don't know, um, but some large event was either being held at Sheen that, that spiked the, uh, the number. Yeah, because we had the same sort of thing at the, um, maybe it was an hour long event. Well, no, because you got 550 at, right after that. So you still have travel, significant travel. It's not people who are being stationary, right? Coming During that on. period. So if they went to Sheen and then they attended something and then they left Sheen and went home, right? Then you'd see a dip in the middle. Uh, that would make sense, right? But we've got 454, 500, and then down to 314. So, I, I mean, if you don't know, it's just yeah, I it don't jumped know. off the page. So Yeah, I mean, usually it, if it spikes like that, there's some sort of large-scale event that's taking place either in the area or um, I don't know if there was construction going on that diverted traffic that way. I, I know that there was a – I don't know if it would go all the way up Highland, but that area was um, – had a, a heavy construction project going on down by the gas station over there. I don't know if the detour was put out at that time, um, but you know, yeah, it's obvious good. that there is a spike in traffic. I just don't know what that's attributed to. Yeah, it'd be late afternoon though too. So uh, that would, anyway, so I just didn't know if you knew. Um, you know, the chicane thing, uh, my most favorite chicane is the um, 
The one at the end of 91 when I go to Bradley Airport, I tell you, I almost take out that curb every time because <laughs> <laughs> you come around the corner and it's like right there. Um, on the, you know, and just to be clear, you can't chase a stolen car presently. No, you can't. No. Yeah, so I just, you know. Well, I, depending on the, what's going on and what, what it did. In yeah. conjunction in, with. Yeah, there's a lot of other circumstances, but just outright stolen, yeah. no. Manslaughter combined yeah, yeah. with. Right, right. can chase. Just shot Got it. Clerk or, yeah. And to speak to that point, I mean, we do encounter, the, you know, stolen vehicles. In fact, we've. Most of the time, our officers are in the right place at the right time, and they encounter the suspects in the vehicle, and they have to let it go to the motoring public looking and wondering why you just turned your lights on, and then you turn your lights off, and then you turn your lights on, and, you know, it's hard to explain to people. It's, it's hard to, you know, people like, why are you not chasing them? Why, why are you letting them go? And it's just a very hard thing to explain that we have, we have no choice. We have to. Yeah, that was changed recently. I mean, it was yeah. in the last three years. I mean, because we had a bill this session to allow you to do that as well as catalytic converters. I mean, you see somebody sawing off a catalytic converter, presently under the law, you, you can't chase. But unfortunately, right. the other side of the aisle doesn't want you to chase. But anyway, um, with regard to the, oh, the Waterbury situation, um, with the red light cameras. I mean, I sit on public safety up there and those cases are not going to court because the judicial branch is not creating a court just for Waterbury. They're gonna be, well, at least it was represented to us, they're gonna be handled like we do um, snow tickets here. Uh, they have no procedure, they have no retention period. You know, those are all things, because if I want to defend somebody before the city of Waterbury, I want to see the video, especially if, you know, they're not taking pictures of individuals. So that system is fraught with problems, and I don't think that's going to go anywhere soon. But the triangulation on entry into the town makes some sense. Um, and I know I talked to one of your detectives years ago about this, and you know we go back and forth about the the license plate readers and retention and all that stuff. And you know he explained to me that it would be helpful when you see a, a common vehicle coming into town, and then there's ransacking in cars, and then the next weekend you know common vehicle again, and then you can somehow link that up. So I, I totally see where that would be helpful to the force and to, you know, all the complaints we get about people going through cars. If you had some sort of way to do that, to monitor. Um, so I just, you know, I know it's not before us, but certainly I would be in favor of something like that. I think that would be a really good tool. And with the catalytic converters also, you know, you don't have to chase, but if you know that somebody was in town and we had, you know, bunch of catalytic converters missing and then two weeks later same thing you know I leave it to you guys but you know that's this kind of stuff I think you're looking for to, to solve cases correct I mean and we get a hot sheet basically all the cars that are stolen come in either from New Haven or, or um, Waterbury New Britain those get entered into that system so as soon as that car crosses the, the camera it'll alert us that that is in town and where so yes it would be effective for us yeah, okay. So, you know, certainly if you want to do something along those lines, I mean, you've got support at least in the seat. So, but thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Tata. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening again. Um, a couple of things. Uh, state roads, you don't have jurisdiction over doing anything on those, correct? We can put up <clears throat> the logic cameras on those state roads we have. We've also put up the speed trailers, but as far as manipulating the speeds on those, as far as speed limits, no. We'd have to, the state would have to do that. We can't Any enforce, other? though. We, we can't enforce, we can't but enforce. We, can't, we cannot change. So, you know, I can't drop Route 68 to 30 miles an hour. The state would have to do that. Okay, and then same thing for any of those, like, road improvements. You can't do anything with those, correct? In order to do it on those state roads, we would have to work with the state of Connecticut to do so. But as far as our town roads go, we can, we can do that, you know, okay. as a project. Okay, yeah, um, Route 68 is, is kind of scary. And it, it's, I'm, on, I'm on that all the time because I'm right off North, I'm on North Farms. And um, that intersection there to take the left on a North Farms, I mean, you're stopped at that light. It's got, like, the red arrow, so the rest is green. And, I mean, the cars are, like, flying by you on there. Um, and it seems to me that it's worse since they recently repaved it. I don't know if they didn't 
if they're not using the reflective paint anymore. Um, but it seems like the lines are much less visible now. Um, so again, I mean, I know it's not your, there's nothing really you can do about it, but, um, and I've, other people have said the same thing. It just seems like it's worse since they, they repaved it. Um, so that, that area kind of is a little, a little scary. But um, uh, as far as the, those, the traffic bot, like the speed boxes, I think um, those do work. I slowed down going through one the other day. So <laughs> those definitely catch your attention and, uh, and help out a little bit. Um, and then just while, you know, while you're here, I just wanted to, to thank you both and your department for everything you do for us. Um, you know, just tonight, I think you've had three, you've been up here three times, I think, already, and maybe being asked to stay for another topic. Um, you know, and you've, you're always very knowledgeable, very professional. Um, everybody in your department I've ever worked with or had any interaction with um, has been just an utmost professional, compassionate, um, the things that you need to be aware of. I mean, just tonight you're talking about, you know, arsons and security cameras and budgets and ARPA money and traffic and the things you deal with on a daily basis. Um, I think it's, we're probably lucky that we don't know about most of it, um, but we, we really appreciate you all and your department. So I just wanted to thank you for that. We thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions or comments from the public? Well, you get to skate. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good night. Next up, consideration and possible action on the right of first refusal for the purchase of 862 North Farms Road. Mr. Chairman, due to the fact that the Town of Wallingford's Code of Ethics contains a provision about conflict of interest, possible appearance of impropriety in accordance with the requirements of the code, I recuse myself from matter number eight. Okay, thank you. We have a video projector if you want to use it. I didn't bring my PowerPoint tonight. Okay. It's at home. My dog ate it. I don't have a dog, but <laughs> if I did, my dog would have eaten it. <laughs> I'll send my dog over. Oh, I'll send the Send the puppy, please. No offense to your other dog. Um, so you may recall that we had this rate of first refusal. This is the property that abuts the firehouse on North Farms Road. And when we bought that land, we took a right of first refusal on the portion of the property that has the house on it. Um, you may also recall that a couple of years back, we were approached by the owner if we had any interest in buying it from them at that time, um, we did not. So at this point in time, the property has been listed for sale and there is an offer on the table. So the right of first refusal gives the town the opportunity to buy the property on the same terms as the offer. Um, it is a, an offer of what I said, $249,100. $249,100 and um, there's no contingencies. So we have 21 business days, which would be the 19th um, of April to make a decision as to whether or not we buy it. Um, if we did, the only contingency would be a title report. Um, otherwise, we would be obligated to buy it if we exercise it. So I'm here to see if you have any interest in doing so. And if not, we would vote not to exercise that right. And I would advise them that they could proceed. Uh, has the administration identified any use for the property? I'm not aware of any uh, interest by the fire department or any other department. Thank you. Um, and do you do you actually need us to take action? Yes. Okay. So well, I guess technically, you, well, then they'd have to wait the full. Yes, I'd like rather you voted to. If we're not interested, if you're not interested. I'd rather so, you voted to do. So, so you need um, a motion to waive our right of first refusal. Yes. Is there a motion to waive our right of first refusal? So moved. Second. Moved by, by Marone, seconded by Zandri. Okay. Any further discussion from the council? Councilor Tesla. Right. So just to be clear, there doesn't seem to be a request or an immediate need from any department that might be able to use this property? That's correct. I okay. believe the previous time we solicited from the departments was no interest. I'm not aware of any change in that. 
-hmm. Well, you know, I'm very interested in having us put up a skate park, but I think we already have enough land to do that. I wouldn't, wouldn't advocate buying more property for it. I don't think that's the best spot for it anyway, but although it'd be right next to the fire department in case anybody broke their leg. But aside from that, um, yeah, I'm, I, I don't, I have no problem with not buying this. Any other comments from the council? Any questions or comments from the public? There being none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you. All right. Can I get a motion to go into executive session pursuant to Connecticut General Statute Section 1206D with respect to the purchase, sale, or leasing of property? Mr. Chairman, I move uh, we go into executive session pursuant to Connecticut General Statute Section 1-206D with respect to the purchase, sale, and or leasing of property. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, I declare the council in executive session. Please kindly clear the chambers.
questions? I would have, I would have gone. Call the meeting back to order. Can I get a motion to come out of executive session? So, so moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, I declare the council back in public session. Uh, before adjournment, Councillor Testa has asked to make a special statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm sharing uh, just a brief statement on behalf of the Friends of the Animal Shelter. Uh, the National Animal Control Association has designated the second week of April each year as Animal Control Officer Appreciation Week. I would like to take this opportunity to recognize and thank and commend our animal control officers, Mitch, Rachel, Casey, and Sarah, for their dedicated service. These devoted professionals answer calls for assistance, capture, roaming, and potentially dangerous animals, rescue animals in danger, investigate reports of animal abuse, educate pet owners about responsible care, and mediate disputes between neighbors regarding pets. I encourage all citizens to join me in expressing our sincere appreciation for their service and dedication that they provide to our animal companions. And as always, please consider our shelter when you're looking to adopt your next dog or cat. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, there being no further business on our agenda, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved and seconded. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, I declare this meeting adjourned. Be back in five.
Good evening or later. I'd like to call to order this special town council meeting, a workshop on the budget for April 11, 2023. Please rise for a moment of silence. I we'll the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, what I'd like to do is, there are some of us who are here for this meeting anyway, but for the ones who aren't necessarily, I'd like to know if there are questions for the probate budget. Judge Bernie, on your first budget, you get to skate. Have a good night. Thanks for your patience. And then um, questions for Coalition for a Better Wallingford. Looks like you have no takers. You do. Okay, question. There are questions. You stick around and then youth and social services. All right. And the rest of us are here anyway. So going in order, page 18 is the law department. Do we have questions for the law department? Councillor Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening. Thank you for being here. Um, I noticed that in line 57, uh, 57902, that you requested um, a capital expenditure of $5,000 that indicates copier, scanner, and accessories, and yet that was not approved by the mayor. What's up? You approved it, us buying it this year, tonight, in your consent agenda. Okay. So... Uh, so I, just didn't I, I had it. put it in for the next year's budget, and the mayor, the mayor they asked us to it. buy it now. Okay, so I just didn't see the link news. up in the backup. So okay, that I thought maybe you were getting to. Um, oh, that would be nice. It would be. <laughs> we don't have any room for it, although I do have a new conference room. So. Oh, I know they're vital, though, especially the scanning now with everything being electronic. We have a horrible, horrible copy machine. <laughs> yeah, no, I. I appreciate and uh, I know how vital they are. So that's, that's all I wanted to ask about. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions for the law department? <laughs> thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. I, think I heard Jerry say run away. I said something like that, yes. <laughs> Why don't we take the Coalition for a Better Wallingford and Youth and Social Services together? Page 42. Hello. Good evening. Hello, everybody. Is there anything new and remarkable about the Youth and Social Services budget? <laughs> uh, new and remarkable. So I have... Um, Just in regards to our staffing that we're doing, so, that, so you'll see that the, the number was raised, um, which mean, really was for, to identify with the part-time, there's two part-time staff that, because of their caseloads right now, need that little bit of extra, the 13 uh, weeks. So that's part of that, um, where they can work more hours. So that, that's a piece of it. Um, and then I have a seasonal position that I can utilize that's being funded as well as a part-time, or another seasonal position. So there's two seasonal positions in that line for the holiday seasons when things come up and we need that extra help. But other than that, that I mean, I think those are the big ones for us. We're looking, 
I think this year moving forward, I'm looking for more counseling because we're getting a lot of phone calls for that. A lot of people are on wait lists. Um, people are struggling with um, being underinsured, high copays. Um, so we're filling that need in the interim. Uh, we are, I think the other big piece is we, we're tight. We have a tight space. So we have counselor sharing offices, um, which makes it hard to hire like a full-time uh, counselor right now because, and so in the future, not now, it's something I would want to look into. But other than that, I think it's pretty, it's not a, a crazy buzz budget for me. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Tata. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening. All right. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for staying so late. <laughs> um, so just a couple of questions about the new staffing. So I did see that you have the, it looks like the two new um, positions there, but then on the, the budget page on the front, so page 42, I don't see any increased staffing numbers. So that's because, well, it hasn't, those weren't funded positions. So there was money in that line for two seasonal positions that were, um, that we had funded. But the additional two, so this is my predecessor. We had always had four seasonal positions made available. But with the funding that was there, two of those positions were funded, and the other two just kind of, there was nothing, that, there was no funding there. So that's, we've added that, so now we can utilize that when we need it moving forward. Okay, so we always, so we always funded for four, but we only ever had two, and now you're hoping to actually utilize all four? Correct. Okay, okay, understood. Um, okay, and then my other question is, and this, this may be where the coalition comes in, if we can kind of do mm -hmm. both at once. Um, I don't see anything listed for the coalition for a better Wallingford. I don't see any backup. I didn't see anything in your letter, and so I'm they assuming it's line 58201 community grants. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, okay. that's it. That's the line that the coalition falls under. Okay, so can we just get some description of what exactly that, it looks like you requested 50,000, um, the mayor has approved 30,000, which is the same as it is in the current budget. So can you just explain what, what that 30,000 goes towards? Um, well, it goes, it goes towards, you can wanna jump in. Sure. Yeah. So when, when we formed 10 years ago, and we were working with Craig, um, we needed our own place, we needed a real organization, so figured out what our overhead would be, which included a, a part-time administrator, administrative assistant, who's now a, a program director, or program manager. Um, and those costs totaled about $30,000. Over the course of the 10-year period, it's actually been about eight for our funding, those costs have increased to, to over $50,000. The program director is now spending more time, they make more money, our rent went up, all of our utilities went up. When we first formed, uh, the um, Liz got us some good deals with town uh, utilities. So we were paying next to nothing for them. Now we're paying full boat. And like I said, those costs have gone up. And that's, that's why the uh, increase was reflected, just what those costs were. OK, so the, so the 30,000, so you're saying that's going towards um, salary, benefits, rent, Utilities, utilities, telephone, uh, Wi-Fi, all of those things. Okay. And what's your um, security insurance? What is your your annual operating budget? Is uh, this year it's it was seventy eight thousand. Okay. So this approximately. Is... Um, comes from a number of sources. Uh, regional grant, uh, fundraisers like festival festival of trees, the life is good sales and donations. So we've been very fortunate that we've been able to muster donations to make up any difference that we come up with, that, that we encounter. Um, the other thing is, on our awareness campaigns, we have a, a tremendous opportunity to kind of use things that are less expensive, maybe not as productive, but we can still stay busy getting them. What's worried me is that uh, everything is more expensive Billboards are more expensive, paper is more expensive, people are more expensive, and we really need a solid funding source. Um, and I see that 
looking ahead, probably in the two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollar range. Um, as you know, I've, I've told you, I'm not going to be here much longer. I'm going to be here long enough to make sure that there's continuity, that there's funding in place, and that there's a structure. Um, and we've got a search committee that's worked awfully hard to find us some candidates. And we're fortunate enough with some ARPA funds and the lawsuits that are paying off that we can offer some money up and get somebody in with some experience in all of these things. So we've been sharing with Mandy and Vanessa um, where all of those searches are. I'm pretty excited about the future, frankly. That's great. Now you're, so you do not have an executive director currently, correct? Or are you? I, I'm, I'm the acting executive director. Okay. But you don't receive a salary or you? I've never taken any money. Okay, so now a new person would, so it's gonna require, would be a salary position. Yeah, and we're negotiating that, but it's probably going to ultimately be in the eighty to ninety thousand dollar range. But moving into it, it'll be somewhere between thirty and sixty. I don't know what that number is, um, but we do have an opportunity for some federal grant money that we've kind of walked away from historically because they're very restrictive. Now they've loosened them up used to be run by SAMHSA, now it's run by the CDC. They understand they need to be a little more lenient with how the reporting that's required. So we're looking at that again, but it's a monumental task to put that together, and frankly, I haven't had the time this year to do it. So with one of the new candidates, I would expect that to be in place. It's called the Drug-Free Community Grant. It's a 10-year, $125,000 a year grant. It's specifically designed to give coalitions the monies they need to form sector reps, to have an organization, to have an executive director, to get all the training they need, all of that stuff. So we've, uh, you know, we're fortunate enough that Vanessa and Mandy and Tony and other people come to our monthly meetings and help guide that. And I, I, I'm looking forward to that continuing. Yeah, and, it means and a I, lot. Sure, and I assume, obviously, if that if that person's able to secure that grant and that pays that person's salary yes plus so that would be good yeah. okay. so we need we need a stopgap between now and then a bridge okay. and I think with the funding that's out there right now we're gonna be able to get there okay um, you know I'm certainly I, I certainly appreciate all that you do um, my I'm just I'm a little concerned only because um, you know usually for all the social services we have you know budgets and, and being statements and a lot of backup and we I, I mean coalition isn't even mentioned in the budget. It was, I mean, I assumed it was that line item, um, but only because I remember it from previous budgets. Um, and then I know, you know, you're receiving money from the, the opioid settlement that we recently approved um, and ARPA money. Um, so it would, it would be nice to see all of that just so that we can, you know, I mean, we kind of have to justify that we're, you know, we're giving $30,000 to an organization and we really don't have any backup here. Um, so I'm glad, you know, you're answering the questions. Um, but so we publish our financial statements. Okay. They're online, and I have a copy of the budget here, and I'll I'll get a copy to everybody. Yeah, that'll be that'll be helpful if you don't yeah. mind. If, yeah. yeah. It's I based on historic. It, it's not based on moving forward because mm -hmm. it's going to change with all those other monies. But they're spent. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Carmody. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Um, you know, at our at our meeting earlier tonight. Uh, we, we talked about issues involving youth in town, and uh -huh. I think at a lot of meetings prior this year, uh, that has been a uh, familiar issue to us. And I noticed that uh, you're requesting $4,000 $4, increase um, for youth projects. And I was just hoping that you would go through briefly, um, give us an overview of the youth projects that your agency provides the town. So I have a couple of programs we're looking to incorporate in this coming budget. And one being we're changing, I mean, you guys may know it as the peer advocates, we've actually revamped that into a youth leadership program um, where it's a specific group of, of kids who have been, you know, are being interviewed and are just looking for more. You don't have to be the honor roll student, you don't have to be, you know, but you've demonstrated some sort of um, leadership, maybe within a classroom, maybe a teacher recognizes something in you, you've helped another student out. So things like that, and where we're putting this, this group together, and they're actually gonna be working on some prevention projects. We're gonna train them, 
you know, coming to different, utilizing different agencies in town so that they're familiar um, with what's out there, what they can, you know, pull their, youth, pull their peers into um, and being a resource for them. Um, you may see them here come and, you know, watch a town council meeting. You know, there might be some youth that are interested in getting involved that way. So that's something that I'm looking forward to do, into doing. Um, also, uh, a component of that would be a youth uh, mentoring program. So taking high school students and going to a, like a lower level elementary school, uh, working with youth at younger ages, um, after school hours, that kind of thing. So that would, so some of the monies would be for that as well. Uh, that, and again, that would, I'm looking to start that next school year. You know, having time to, to train everybody as well for that. We have uh, the other money that we're looking to use it for is upcoming events. I mean, historically, Youth and Social Services has not participated in Celebrate Wallingford. Um, so that's something we're looking to do again. Um, they did way back years, years ago, um, when I probably first started in town. But that's something that I want to bring back and, that, and having a table there um, and handing out information. And then we have things like project graduation, you know, that we're involved with, we help out with. I mean, that's a huge event, as we all know. We have a backpack program that we, you know, help students get ready for school that, again, are struggling. Uh, another upcoming program would be, there's, well, we have two. So we have the, as we talked about earlier, the, you guys know it as the Juvenile Review Board, but we're calling it the Walling for Juvenile Diversion Program. Um, so having money that, you know, that we can tap into for different, um, in the way of, I don't want to involve consequences for the youth. You know, like if we need to tap into, you know, whether it's curriculum that we need to use um, for our intervention coordinator, because that'll be an assignment for her to, to work with youth on, uh, or any other project idea that might come up, but we want them involved in, but we need the materials for it. And we have a, a youth fire setter program that has actually been around for 20 years. Um, where the youth division of the police department collaborated with the um, fire marshal's office, and we worked with youth fire setters. You know, usually curiosity based. There was a training that went, went along with it. We have now that has been revamped in the state. Uh, so myself and um, acting fire marshal Brian Shock were running the program. And again, you know, if there's a fire incident in town. Um, whether it's curiosity, family calls up, um, if it's a, you know, maybe school personnel might see something that's, you know, making it, it's an interest for the youth, whatever, court could order youth to come to the fire program. Um, and there's a whole testing requirement on our end that's been completed and, you know, moving, there's a whole step by step. So that's, a few things. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Moving forward. I appreciate it. Thank you for all for all that you do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, both of you. Um, when the coalition was created and uh, Craig Turner was here, I know, I believe the reason why they're not mentioned in the budget is the structure that was in place at that time. Um, in that there was some sort of, um, I, I don't know what you call it, not a hierarchy, but it wasn't like a block grant. Um, I, you know, I don't know what Craig actually required, but um, monies were um, conveyed on a periodic basis, I think mm -hmm. on a monthly basis. Quarterly. Based upon, okay, mm -hmm. based upon some sort of um, representation that something had been done, therefore justifying. Mm -hmm. is, is that the that's situation? still going on, yeah. Okay, that's, yeah. and that would explain why they're not mentioned in the budget. Mm -hmm. You know, the social worker counselor thing is really of concern to me. Um, 
it, you know, you recognize that you don't have enough, um, mm -hmm. and I don't want you constrained by space. Mm -hmm. So, if you had the magic wand, what would you actually be asking us for for counselors? Like, what kind of money are you talking? Oh, the wish list. <laughs> well, I mean, a reasonable wish list, because you know, I'll t you know, I don't. When I'm hearing. You know, I've been to where your offices are, mm -hmm. right? And I know it, it, it is tight, tight, right? But we also know that the pandemic created a lot of mental health issues, Correct. right? Mm -hmm. So it created a need that is outside of the space that you were originally allotted, which may have been sufficient at mm -hmm. that time. But, you know, I know we have mental health issues in our schools, right? Mm -hmm. So nothing stopped, you know, we hear that Sheehan is empty. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> I'm being facetious, but that there's space at you in, mm -hmm. right? So working together, if you had a counselor, it would appear based upon cases that have come across my desk, mm -hmm. that it may be helpful that we had a counselor at Sheehan through Youth and Social Services, right? Stuff like that. So mm -hmm. your space at Fairfield Boulevard should not constrain. Right, and it does, and in regards to that, I mean, we do utilize, we've gotten creative. So a lot of times our counselor, um, we have, so our, the way our, our counseling system works, right? We have, so we have the two part-timers um, and they're, they're split during the week. So I have one that's Monday, Tuesday, I have one that's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, based on their hours, they split they divvy things up. And based upon the case, so the, the, I'm the gatekeeper for all the cases that come in. So I know who, how many cases that people, how many families fit um, the kind of cases that they're getting? You know, some are heavier than others, right? So that goes with our intervention coordinator. She does all the, the vaping. A um, big part of her job is the vaping, the alternative to suspension program through the high schools um, and the middle schools. So she'll get those cases where you're meeting with a student four or five times um, with different education uh, and assignments and, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, around that topic to, to reduce the, the amount of suspension. So it goes from 10 days to five days. Um, we do, so we're utilizing, we also do groups as well within, um, within town. So different like topic specific topics. Like we just had one, our, our social worker uh, did at the library about healthy relationships. And it was a four week series for teens you know, what does a healthy relationship look like and kind of breaking it down um, different categories. So we, util we utilize the library a lot. We've utilized um, coalition in their space. We're utilizing the library. Um, or I said the library, uh, schools, both schools, um, you know, their conference rooms and that sort of thing when we need to. So do you feel that you need more counseling services? If you, if you, if the space is sufficient, if you have enough space, you can mobilize and all that stuff. What I need is a, like, a, what I need is the office space for some, if, you know, more. So if I, if let's say ideally right now, you're asking me today, what I, I could see is maybe two, two full-time counselors. And I wouldn't really have a place for them to be. I'd have one Counts are kind of like, okay, coming in, checking in, and then having to, to, to go out, which may be appropriate, but depending on the clientele, depending on the topic that they're, why are they meeting with this youth, they may not, may not be appropriate to meet in a school. It may be more appropriate to meet in an office setting. Um, so it really depends. So yeah, I would need more space for sure. There, though. Yeah. You in town, I mean, in town somewhere. Right, so somewhere. Yeah, somewhere. So I Eventually, just, yes. Okay. It, I mean, the other piece, too, is with this opioid settlement grant, one of the things I'm looking to do is get a licensed drug and alcohol counselor um, part-time for, for a period of time with this grant and assessing and seeing kind of, you know, how it's being used. Is it more of a group setting? Is it more individual um, population? You know, is it more youth-based? Is it more, you know, adults? Uh, so really... Well, you're going to have the same issue with cannabis. Mm -hmm. right? We're already seeing it. Yeah. Um, so never mind alcohol. I mean... Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. 
and that's that's where you're going. And, you know, just you know, you and I have had discussions. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Family with Service Needs program. I don't think people understand, but um, you know, the situation is that as of well four years ago, when you had a child who was truant, um, wasn't going, um, mm -hmm. you know, acting up at home, parents couldn't handle that kind of stuff. They'd reach out to you. Mm -hmm. You would apply for the Family with Service Needs program that's run out of the juvenile court. They'd assign a probation officer to, to get involved with that kid. Mm -hmm. um, but that program went away, mm -hmm. which has put more on your shoulders. Correct. They didn't locally. replace it. Yeah, so I mean, it's all, I mean, they, they, right, the program went away and there was no replacement. Um, it's, everything was put back on the towns. Yeah, which, board. you know, I do, I did get a bill passed out of the committee, at least, to restore that program. Mm -hmm. We'll see where it goes as we talk about juvenile stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think it's vital. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's another area that I think you need counseling. I mean, the family that I, I brought to you mm -hmm. recently, that's the situation, mm -hmm. right? And mom's like, what, what do I do? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I appreciate you getting involved in that. The JRB situation, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was glad that the chief was here to talk about it tonight. Um, but essentially, you know, that's being forced on us because the juvenile court system um, sending cases back to the towns to deal with on a diversionary basis. Um, I didn't see anything in your budget, though, having to do with that. Specifically? Yeah. Um, in the way of staffing? I don't know. I would, I, would, I would expect that something would be on your budget. With the I kind of wanted to see how it was going to go, to be honest. Okay. I wanted to assess it a little bit. Um, you get, just jumping into it and not knowing how this model is going to work for us, if we needed to tweak things, if we needed to, you know, I wasn't, in my head, wasn't prepared to put down. And, and because you're the expert on it, I just wanted, because I know you and I talked about implementation and that kind of stuff. Are you going to run them in that big uh, hearing room that's there at Park and Rec? So initially, that was a thought. But what we're going to do is we're actually going to run them at the police department uh, and using their classroom space there. Uh, and then right for the, for the time being, right now, we're going to utilize police staff um, officers, whoever the chief decides to, to nom you know, to assign, um, as well as youth and social services staff. We're going to start just with us um, as a panel, and then incorporate as time goes on. Start to incorporate others again to get a better handle of how this is going to look. And are you planning on having those, um, like with everybody else sequestered, or is everybody going to be in the room? You know, because I know that's an aspect, especially with juveniles. You know, where one family sees what, what another child, you know, maybe what they did, because parents are usually involved in the JRB. So how? Oh do no, that we'll keep it the confidentiality. Well, so okay. we'll schedule those those appointments so that there's yeah there is space and there's there's the police department. I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming everyone's been in there. You know, in relation to the classroom, it's actually where my old office was. Is there's a you know a waiting area, so we're able to kind of it's all close in the back of the building, um, so it would work out fine. And and the plan is to have the youth is going to you know come in and have to you know take ownership. I mean that's part of the part of the program. You have to accept your responsibility in this incident. Um, if not, then it's got to go back to the juvenile court system. Yeah, no, I, I understand. I appreciate. It. I just, you know, I just want to. I'm very concerned about the counseling aspect. And that's so. And part of that, in this juvenile diversion program, we're going to. Have, I'm actually going to have one of our counselors involved in that, because that might she might be someone that's going to have to, you know, give her point of view, doing you know, help with an assessment, you know, depending upon the case and what's happening. Um, our intervention coordinator will, will be assigned to actually work with the family and the youth and make sure all the boxes are checked and you know what they need to get done is completed in a timely fashion and I mean she may provide education as well to the youth if that's something that the panel decides is going to going to happen so yeah so I'm just I'm curious to see how it's all going to 
work. And every, and every case will be different. Absolutely. But, you know, at the end of the day, I leave it up to you. You're the expert here. I just, mm -hmm. you know, I just want to flag for you. I'm concerned about the amount of social workers that we have availability to use in this town. So, mm -hmm. but thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Tata. Hi, sorry, one <laughs> question I forgot to ask. Um, I just wanted to clarify, that, so this is more for the coalition, but okay. with you. Um, the rent that you pay for the storefront, that, that comes out of the 30,000 or the town pays your rent in addition to that? No, it comes out of it. It comes out of that, no. okay, perfect. Just wanna clarify, thank you, yeah. I appreciate it. Any other questions for youth and social services or the coalition? Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thanks good for your night. support, guys. On to the mayor's office budget. Councilor Carmody. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I, I want to commend the mayor uh, for being consistent in applying his frugality uh, to himself. But I, I think it's important uh, that the salary uh, of, of your role is commensurate to the duties uh, of the job. And, I do not think the salary is at a place that it should be. Um, I do not think it is a competitive salary. Uh, the mayor is the manager of our town, and when we look to our surrounding communities, uh, Cheshire, Southington, Meriden, uh, the town managers in those towns are making much more uh, than the mayor is making here. I, I took some time this afternoon to look at the Cheshire's proposed budget for this year, and the town manager is making $176,500, the Meriden, uh, city manager's proposed budget salary is $169,792, and the Southington's uh, proposed budget salary was $184,265. Um, right now, uh, the salary is at $96,000 uh, for, for the mayor of Wallingford, and um, I think it needs to be raised considerably, uh, maybe not to the point of some of these surrounding towns, um, but I, I think at least to $130,000 or around there. Um, and so I just wanted to put that out there. You know, I, I, I'm going to do some more research before our motions meeting uh, in early May. But um, I, I think it's time, and I think this is the year to do it, uh, to, to raise the, the salary, to be more competitive and commensurate with the duties uh, of the job. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Zandri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm going to just echo Councillor Carmody's comments. I mean, we've, we've discussed this over the years. I know the last time that the administrative aid um, caught up and I think almost was gonna surpass the mayor by $600 that one particular year and, and we made an adjustment then. Um, we're basically talking about a $7,000 differential right now between those two roles. And I think based on some of the legwork and research that, that um, Councillor Carmody made, I, I think it's good that we consider this for this year. Um, um, it's it's definitely a, a um, the time to, to there's, there's been other times we should have looked at it. Without a doubt, we should be looking at it now. Um, I don't mean to underscore anybody else's salaries w within the budget books, but I mean, if you, it, it doesn't take you very long to see that a lot of rank and file workers, and, and they do a lot of important jobs for the town, are within $10,000 of the, of the person that's responsible for a $180 million budget. So I think, I think we really all sitting here should consider that when we get to the motion stage. Thank you. Mayor, nobody has questions for you. <laughs> if you choose, although I think you're probably sitting in for program planning and government TV, so. Uh, well, and maybe even the town clerk. Next is the town council budget. Questions on the town council budget. Councillor Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, focusing on the, the clerk line, which uh, I believe we had last year. I don't think there's any prospect of filling that um, in this budget would mean that there was approximately $24,000 that we could have transferred for Doolittle Park cameras earlier tonight. But um, what is the prospect of us actually having a clerk next during this budget season? Um, 
Well, I, I didn't budget for it because when we talked about hiring somebody, we pivoted to archiving uh, the minutes. So I, I didn't think the council wanted someone and we would continue to use the clerk's office for support. So the 18,252 uh, from last year is not going to get expended, but why um, the, the archiving, I guess, is what now appears at 56601? That's correct. Okay. So we talked about, so the archiving the minutes would, have we put that out to bid or something? It's, it's actually, um, we used, we had an archive bid. I can't remember the name of the vendor, um, but we're using that vendor and it's actually being done as we speak. And um, I anticipate the database will be available on the town website any day. So they would be creating the indexes that we talked about also that the clerk used to create? Yes, you will be able to word search the documents. And then are they gonna take the old indexes? So that's part of the archiving, uh, taking the old indexes and make them word searchable, so on and so forth? Actually, we didn't get to the indexes, but um, all the minutes that are not in hardbound books um, are going to be um, scanned and uploaded, and they will be um, readable so that you can do a word search. Okay, so I had previously asked about the indexes, and you said those were being done, but what I'm hearing is that, I mean, I, I don't want to, um, I, I'm what Sandy, what our former clerk was doing was, and they're back there in the room, is she would create almost like a table of contents on a particular topic so that, if you, let's say you wanted to know about how many, you know, when the council discussed the community pool in a particular year. You would go to the index, it would say community pool, and it would say, you know, this meeting in February, this one in March, this one in July. That's the indexing that, that we had up until the time that some people up here decided we didn't have a clerk anymore. So am I to understand that that is not going to be done? Because that was what we talked about, that individual being engaged in. So I apologize, I don't recall the specific discussion about the index, um, but if you are able to word search, then I'm not so sure you really need the index. Well, you would, uh, if you can't identify, I would expect that an entire year is not going to be the electronic thing, right? It would more than likely be Minutes from today's meeting, minutes from the last, you know, last meeting, you'd be able to go into those and you'd be able to word search those for where those words appear in those minutes. And that is not as anywhere near as useful as the indexing that our former clerk used to do, where I would know which meeting to look through those minutes. Um, that's, that's what we were trying to achieve with this individual, so. So with that, uh, I can meet again with the archive company we we're using and have them look through the indexes that exist um, to scan those. Um, but I was not I, I didn't recall that we, we were looking for somebody to do indexes going forward. That's just not my recollection. Well, I don't know, well, that was in addition to taking minutes at the meeting. So I, I leave it at that, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Murrow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, respectfully to Councilor Fishbein, my recollection was just that the word search is what we had talked about, because that would be the most efficient way to, to pull the data together, because otherwise, if you have it indexed, I can certainly understand the benefit, but on some level, there's a judgment that goes into creating an, an index, right? And therefore, if you miss an item and it's not in the index, it becomes 
you know, someone's judgment. I mean, a word search is sort of the modern way to, to do these kinds of things. So I am sensitive to what you're saying in terms of if you can only search one document. I, I guess we haven't seen the product yet, so it's hard to say, make a judgment on that. Um, my question, though, uh, Mr. Chairman, so 1500 bucks is that the anticipated annual expense then to have this data archived, or is that until we reach a certain point? Um, I so there's going to be money expended in the current year, several thousand dollars for the project. Okay. And um, I think we're going to take that out of the, um, that salary line we had for the clerk. Um, and then there's some anticipated going forward. 1500 might be a little rich based upon the numbers I saw when I, uh, when I met with our vendor. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping it's more than adequate. Okay. All right, thanks. I'm just excited to get this going. Your efforts. Thank you, Councillor Fishbein. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Something just popped up, um, and I know we didn't ask um, Judge Bernie um, about his budget, but I will note that in the probate court budget, um, there was a charge for $2,500 for internet, but our budget, it appears, doesn't have any such entry and from time to time we're told not to share passwords with anybody else why isn't the internet appearing in our budget if we are the only ones that are supposed to be using it or where does it appear in the budget so that is a good question I mean I know we have a dedicated data line for the council Wi-Fi um, I, I would have thought that was I think 2,500 is is a lot for the probate court, but I, you know, yeah, no, it was their request. I, I'm, I know we're getting the service, and I'm not sure where we're paying for it. It, it could be. I, th I think it may be in office expenses, but 3,300 in that. Yeah. Would, um, do we know what portion is? Who, uh, who pays that bill for you? Is it the town clerk's office or? Historically, yes. Okay, so we'll, we'll have to out. check with them as to what bills are associated with it. And I'd like to know the amount because if we're paying $2,500 for, I mean, it is the taxpayer's money, but that, that appears to be it's like 200 bucks a month, right? I, I, you know, unless we have, we have Comcast and we have TV, cable TV in here too? So um, I, I do recall when we um, secured the line that um, we were looking at a different kind of service than, it, than is available to the general public. Um, and uh, I believe I worked with uh, Mr. Baltramitis in Public Works on that. Um, so. Um, you know, initially we thought there was a, you know, a plan for $75 a month, and then when they find out you're a, a government entity, there's a, some type of different quote that you get for that type of service. But I can dig a little deeper and find out what it is we're paying. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? All right. I'm done, but I'm not leaving. Uh, Questions on the town clerk's budget, page 56. Don't worry, Cheryl Ann, we're not going to ask you questions. Councillor Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the server, what is the, we appropriated or approved 1931, it appears, last year? What's the status of that? That's all been, all taken care of. Okay. Um, so that we had to come back and get that money reappropriated. 
So th this was, that money lapsed at the end of last year. It wasn't carried forward. So at, at some, I don't remember what council meeting, but we, we did do a transfer <coughs> into their accounts to, to finish that off. So um, I don't recall that since the budget book, I mean, this is our first meeting, right? So how come it's not reflected? It's not reflected in the book. So I'll, I'll look into that. Okay. And um, do we know what that server is for? It was their land record server. Okay. Well, but I see right above that line, it says server land records, right? So she was supposed to buy the server and the software with the original $10,000. She bought the server, the year expired, and she didn't have the software, so we had to go back and get the software. Okay, and that's, that's the system so that, I mean, a server usually um, has some connection to the internet, um, and I thought our land records were through, um, not vision, the other server. It's caught. So I think I, I'm not an IT person, but I believe this is a dedicated server for their land records to run that cot system for people to go down there and do their searches. Okay. Um, seems like an awful lot of money, but... Um, and then do we have... Um, through the COT system, when I go online um, and I want to pay, I want to print something. There's revenue tied to that. Is that shown in the budget? I'm not. I would have to check down with the town clerk's office. Okay. I'm not aware. You know, if. If there is, it would just be miscellaneous. It would come in as miscellaneous revenue in the 47040 account. Yeah, if you could find out, because, um, you know, I, I was always a proponent of, of having this stuff online and always made the representation that we could make money off of it. And I'd be interested to know, you know, I, I know when I access the system, I've got to pay. It's like a dollar a page or something like that. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, there may not be any revenue because we, we don't host that, uh, COT does, and there's a disclaimer on it to the effect that it is not the town records. Um, so we may not be receiving any money for that. In the past we did, but if once, once COT is doing that online, I'm not sure that we get any revenue. Well, I think the way the system is set up is if I, I can access, like, what is there, but if I go to print it without signing in and, um, and, and giving a credit card, then it's their property. Um, but I well, think what, you're, just, what you're accessing is their records of our records. Well, no, I, I, that's, I think that's the reason why we have this server, that we're $10,000 for a server, is that once you access and you pay for it, we are accessing like it's, um, it's almost like a certified copy, but I don't want to talk. But if we could just find out what's going on with that, I think it would be helpful. Um, yeah, I, I don't think our actual records are online. In fact, well, I'm almost certain of it. Well, I... And, and you're probably aware that COT was hacked into, and uh, I know West Hartford was down for two weeks. Um, most of the state was. Wallingford and about two or three other towns were not. Yeah, I think if you go to the town clerk's portion of the town's website, there's a link that says land records, and you can see all of... If we could just find out. I'll look into that and get back to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Anyone else? Moving along to government TV. Page 17. Councilor Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, um, the field cameras, um, what are we using field cameras for, or what is anticipated? I wasn't aware. Um, well, maybe parade, right? Um, that's the only thing I can think of that they'd be using field cameras for. <coughs> so I, I saw them out a whole bunch during the 350 celebration. Um, they're, I think they're typically at the Memorial Day ceremony before the parade kicks off. Um, I, I've, I've seen them set up at events throughout town. Okay, yeah, that's, um, that's fair. All right, that's all I had. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anyone else on government TV? And last but not least, program planning. Councilor Fishbein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There appears to be an increase in staffing, um, and I can't readily identify that. What is that? On the hourly line. It's the same staff. The uh the secretary went from part-time to a full-time position. Okay, well, I'm, I'm looking at the line that says, oh, I see the part-time, well, no. So in the prior year, it was one, one, and one. Now it's two and one. Okay, so we're cutting staffing. No, we, we're, we, so they, in the prior years, it was classified as the grants technician is the hourly, the secretary was part-time, and the work-study program is the seasonal and other. So now that the secretary is full-time, she moves up to the hourly row, and there's no part-time person there. Okay, the, I guess the, the designation of hourly is a little... interesting because it isn't hourly it's full-time well it's full-time but they're part-time is hourly too right right well it's they're I both mean, it's hourly right so why does it say full-time but anyway um so then okay i got that and is that where mr ryan's um is that where he appeared no he's his salary would have been in the economic development all right, that's all I had. Thank you. Anyone else? Nothing for program planning? All right. No more business on the agenda tonight. I declare this meeting adjourned.